symbol of ours. In the name of peace, we gather here now. Oh Lord, please make these days of ours on this earth filled with peace. Peace TV, the solution for humanity. السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God Almighty be on all of you We begin this concluding session the evening session of the 10 day international Islamic conference and exhibition going on for the last 10 days with the Karat by brother Dr. Uthman Muhammad at Siddiqui from Saudi Arabia. الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أتل ما أوحي إليك من الكتاب وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة تنهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون ولا تجادلوا أهل الكتاب إلا بالتي هي أحسن إلا الذين ظلموا منهم وقولوا آمنا بالذي أنزل إلينا وقولوا آمنا بالذي أنزل إلينا وأنزل إليكم وإلهنا وإلهكم واحد ونحن له مسلمون وكذلك أنزلنا إليك الكتاب 
فالذين آتيناهم الكتاب يؤمنون به ومن هؤلاء من يؤمن به وما يجحد بآياتنا إلا الكافرون وما كنت تتلو من قبله من كتاب ولا تخطه بيمينك إذا لارتاب المبطلون بل هو آيات بينات في صدور الذين أوتوا العلم وما يجحد بآياتنا إلا الظالمون وقالوا لولا أنزل عليه آيات من ربه قل إنما الآيات عند الله قل إنما الآيات عند الله وإنما أنا نذير أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِهِمْ أَنَّا أَنْزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ يُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَرَحْمَةً وَذِكْرَى لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ صدق الله العظيم. Now we have the translation of the Qur'an being read out by Brother Musa Sir Antonio from Australia. Recite, O Muhammad, what has been revealed to you of the book and establish prayer. Indeed, prayer prohibits immorality and wrongdoing, and the remembrance of Allah is greater, and Allah knows that which you do. And do not argue with the people of the book, except in a way that is best except for those who commit injustice amongst them, and say, we believe in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you, and our God and your God is one, and we are Muslims in submission unto him. And thus we have sent down to you the book, and those to whom we previously gave the scripture believe in it. And among these are those who believe in it, and none reject our verses except the disbelievers. And you did not recite before it any scripture, nor did you inscribe one with your right hand. Then otherwise the falsifiers would have had cause for doubt. Rather, it is distinct verses preserved within the breasts of those who have been given knowledge, and none reject our verses except the wrongdoers. But they say, why are not signs sent down to him from his Lord? Say, the signs are only with Allah, 
and I am only a clear warner. And is it not sufficient for them that we reveal to you the book which is recited to them? Indeed, in that is a mercy and a reminder for those who believe. I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, am your host for this evening's program. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation and our thousands of volunteers who have put this program together for our brothers and sisters present here today and the vast multitudes, the millions of people watching this program live on television all over the world on satellites, past 10, Arabsat, Badr 4, Galaxy A10 in US and Canada, South America, and Eurobird 1 covering up the whole of Europe, as well as the Sky TV channel 823 in UK. I welcome all of you to this important event, the concluding session of our 10-day International Islamic Conference and Exhibition on the theme, Peace, the Solution for Humanity. This is the theme session, and we have none other than Dr. Zakir Naik available before you to address this full session. Alhamdulillah. A medical doctor by professional training, Dr. Zakir Naik clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts. He is 42 years old. Dr. Zakir is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks, as he would address you in the question and answer session and open one after his talk, too. In the last 12 years, Dr. Zakir Naik has delivered more than 1,200 public lectures in many countries worldwide, in addition to numerous more public talks in India. He has successfully participated in several symposia and dialogues with prominent personalities of other faiths. His public dialogue with Dr. William Campbell in USA on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science held in Chicago, USA on April 1st, 2000, was a resounding success in establishing that the Quran matches with established scientific facts. His public dialogue with the renowned personality of India, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, on the topic, the concept of God in Hinduism and Islam in the light of sacred scriptures held in the city of Bangalore, India, on January 21st, 2006, too, was a grand success in highlighting Tawheed, the oneness and unity of God. Much before this, Sheikh Ahmad Dida, the world-famous orator on Islam and comparative religion, who had earlier called Dr. Zakir Naik Dida Plus in 1994, in May 2000, presented a plague to him, which stated, awarded to Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik for his achievement in the field of Dawa and the study of comparative religion. Son, what you have done in four years had taken me 40 years to accomplish, alhamdulillah. <laughs> and Sheikh Didat happens to be a pioneer in speaking on comparative religion in English. Dr. Zakir Naik appears regularly on programs and interviews on many international TV and radio channels in more than 200 countries of the world. He has authored many books on Islam and comparative religion, including The Quran and Modern Science, Compatible or Incompatible, Is the Quran God's Word, Women in Islam, Subjugated or Protected, Concept of God in Major Religions, and Answers to Non-Muslims' Common Questions about Islam. In this concluding theme session of the Peace the Solution for Humanity, the 10-day International Islamic Conference and Exhibition, to present his public talk on this vital 
topic of the day is Islam the solution for humanity? Let's welcome the dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion, Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma baad. Auzu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna dina inda Allah al-Islam. Rabbi shahli sadri. Wa silli amri. Wa halul ugdata min lesaani yafqahu kawli. The respected scholars and speakers from different parts of the world. My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic of this last session and the last lecture of this. 10 day international Islamic conference is is Islam the solution for humanity Islam is derived from the root word salam or salam which means peace it's also derived from the Arabic word film which means to submit your will to Almighty God in short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting a will to Almighty God. So the topic of today's lecture is, is peace acquired by submitting a will to Almighty God the solution for humanity? Islam, unlike other religions and other ways of life, which only cater either to the physical needs of the body, or the spiritual aspect. Most of the religions, they mainly cater to the spiritual aspects and the needs of the soul. And some isms, like materialism, etc., as well as communism, they mainly cater to the physical needs of the body. Islam, alhamdulillah, it caters to both the spiritual need of the soul as well as the physical need of the body. It has a dual role. And as far as the solution to humanity is concerned, the glorious Quran is the most positive book in the world. It is a proclamation to humanity. It is a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It is a warning to the heedless. It's a guide to the erring. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering, and it is a hope to those in despair. This glorious Quran has the solution to the problems of humanity. Now, whenever anyone gives you a solution, you'd like to know the source. You'd like to know the authenticity. For example, if you're sick, and if someone gives you a prescription, you'd like to know that who has written the prescription. Is it a doctor? What are his qualifications? Similarly, people would like to know that who is the author of this glorious Quran? People would like to know what is the authenticity of this glorious Quran? But natural, I cannot give the solution for humanity. I am zero in Islam. The best person to give the solution for humanity 
is the creator of humanity. It is the creator of humankind. It is the creator of the world. It is the creator of the universe. The best solution for the problems of humanity can be given by the sustainer, by the cherisher of the humankind, of the whole world, as well as the whole universe. So before we dwell into the topic, I would first like to spend a few minutes telling the audience the authenticity of this book and the source of this book. I'll try and prove in a nutshell that the glorious Quran is the word of Almighty God, as well as those people who do not believe in Almighty God, I will try to prove to them the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God. When an atheist comes and approaches me, and when he tells me that I do not believe in a God, the first thing I do is I congratulate him. People may wonder, why is Zakir congratulating an atheist? The reason I'm congratulating an atheist is because he is thinking. Most of the human beings, they do blind belief. He's a Christian because father is a Christian. He's a Hindu because father is Hindu. Some Muslims, they're Muslim because their fathers are Muslim. This atheist, he is thinking. He may be coming from a religious background, but he does not agree that the God his parents are worshipping, that they can be such a God. So he disagrees in the existence of God. And the reason I congratulate him is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, the first part of the Islamic creed that is La ilaha, that there is no God. The only thing I have to do now is to prove to him, Illallah, but Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. Here, half my job is done. To the other non-Muslims, first, I have to prove to them that the God they are worshipping is not a true God. Here, half my job is done. He has already agreed that there is no God. So only thing I have to prove to him is the existence of the true Almighty God, that is Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. Most of the atheists, they think that science is ultimate. Nowadays, this is the age of science and technology, and they feel that science is ultimate. And if you ask any atheist, that suppose there is an equipment, there is a gadget, which no one in the world has ever seen, no one has heard of, and if that gadget is brought in front of this atheist, and the question is asked that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this gadget, the mechanism of this equipment? The atheist will reply that it will be the creator. Some may say the manufacturer, some may say the maker, some may say the inventor, some may say the producer. Whatever they say, it will be somewhat similar. Either it will be the creator, the manufacturer, the maker, it will be the inventor, it will be somewhat similar. Don't grapple with the words, just keep that answer at the back of your mind. Ask him the question that how did our universe come into existence? He will tell you that initially there was a primary nebula. Later on, there was a secondary separation. There was a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the sun, the planets, and the earth on which we live. This, they call it as the Big Bang. When we ask the atheist that when did you come to know about this creation of the universe, the Big Bang? So he will tell you, we came to know recently, 30 years back, 40 years back. I tell him that this information about the creation of the universe is mentioned in this book, the glorious Quran, 1400 years ago in a nutshell. It's mentioned in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Avalam yaral lazina kafaru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan tarat karam sustakna huma. That the heaven and the earth, they were joined together and we clove them asunder. This big bang, what you're talking about, is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? So he will tell you, maybe it's a flock. Don't argue with him. Continue. 
what is the shape of this earth? So he will tell you that previously the human beings thought that the earth on which we live is flat. It was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake, he sailed around the earth that he proved that the earth was spherical. What you came to know in 1577 is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, where it's mentioned, what are the bad azalika dahaha? And thereafter, we have made the earth egg shape. The Arabic word dahaha, one of its meanings is an expanse, and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And we know that the earth on which we live is not completely round like a ball. It is flattened from the pole and bulging from the center. It is geospherical in shape. And the Arabic word dahaha does not refer to a normal egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if we analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, it too is geospheric in shape. Who could have mentioned 1400 years ago that the shape of the earth is geospherical? The atheist may say, maybe your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was an intelligent person. Don't argue. Continue. The light of the moon, is it its own light or is it a reflected light? So the atheist will tell you, previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Recently in science, 100 years back, 200 years back, 300 years back, we came to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is a reflected light. Quran mentioned in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61. Blessed is he who has made the constellations in the sky and placed therein sun having its own light and moon having a reflection of light, having borrowed light. The Arabic word used for sun is shams. It's always described as siraj or wahaj, meaning a torch or a blazing lamp. The Arabic word used in the Quran for moon is kamar. Its light is always described as munir or nur, meaning borrowed light or a reflection of light. Nowhere does the Quran refer to the moonlight as its own light. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? The atheist, maybe after a long pause, he will say, maybe your prophet, he was extra intelligent. Don't argue, continue. When I was in school, I passed my school in 1982. I had learned in the subject of science and geography that the sun, though it revolved, it did not rotate about its own axis. The atheist will ask, is this mentioned in the Quran? I will tell him, no, no, this is what I learned in school. More than 25 years back, this is what I learned in school. But when I read the verse of the Quran in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, it says, it's Allah who has created the night and the day. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word yasbuhun describes the motion of a moving body, indicating that the sun, besides revolving, it is also rotating about its own axis. And today science tells us that the sun takes approximately 25 days to complete one rotation. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago, which science has discovered recently, just a couple of decades earlier? When I was in school, I didn't know about this. Now, all the test books, they say very clearly that the sun, besides revolving, even rotates about its own axis. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? And most probably, the atheist, he'll be silent. Don't wait for the reply, continue. Today, science tells us that our universe is expanding, which we discovered recently, a couple of hundred years back. Quran mentions in Surah Dariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47, that we have created the expanding universe, the vastness of space. The Arabic word, Musayun. It means the expanding universe, the vastness of space. There may be many critics of Islam who will say, it is nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy since the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. And I do agree with them that the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. But I'd like to remind them 
It was centuries after the Quran was revealed that the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy. So it's from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the field of hydrology, when we asked the atheist that when did we come to know about the water cycle? So he will tell you that Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 was the first person who described the present water cycle. How does the water evaporate from the ocean? It forms into clouds, moves into the interior, it falls on a rain, and the water cycle is replenished. This water cycle is mentioned in the Quran in great detail 1400 years ago. The Quran mentions too that the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, the clouds join, then move into the interior, then the water falls down, and the water table is replenished. The Quran speaks about hydrology and the water cycle in great detail in several verses. In Surah Azumar, chapter 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 57. In Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 40 and 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. In Surah Jai Asha chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf chapter number 50, verse number 9 and 10. In Surah Waqa chapter 56, verse number 68 to 70. In Surah Mulk chapter 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tariq chapter 86, verse number 11. You can quote, only keep on quoting the references. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? Don't wait for the answer to continue. The Quran, it speaks about geology, that the mountains have got pegs which give stability to the earth. It's mentioned in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7. In the field of oceanology, we knew there were two types of water, salt and sweet, but the Quran goes ahead and says, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, it is he who has let free two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable, the other it is salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. And today, we know that this barzakh, what the Quran speaks about, today, those people who are experts in the subject of oceanology, they say this is called as the unseen barrier. The Quran, it speaks about biology. In Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30. We have created every living thing from water. Who could have believed in the deserts of Arabia 1400 years ago where there is scarcity of water that every living creature is made of water? But today, science has testified that. In the field of botany, the Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 53, that we have created the plants in pairs, male and female. Previously, we did not know that even the plants are created in male and female. Quran says in Surah Ra, chapter number 13, verse number 3, that we have created every kind of fruit in pairs. In the field of zoology, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, that the birds and the animals live in community like the human beings which we came to know recently. Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the bee in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 68 and 69. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the spider in Surah Ankabut, chapter number 29, verse number 41. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the ants in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18, all of which we have come to know recently, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back. In the field of medicine, the Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, that we give to the human beings a drink of varying colors coming from the belly of the bee in which there is healing for mankind. Today we have come to know recently that the honey is derived from the belly of the bee and in the honey it has got antiseptic properties. No wonder the Russians used honey to cover up the wounds. This we came to know recently. In the field of physiology, the Quran speaks about the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 66. In the field of genetics, the Quran says in Surah Najam, chapter number 53, verse number 45, 46, as well 
as Surah Qiyama, chapter 75, verse number 37 and 39, that it is the male fluid, the sperm, which is responsible for the sex of the child, which we have come to know recently. The Quran speaks about embryology in great detail. In Surah Alaq, chapter 96, verse number 1, that we have created the human being from alaqa, that's a leech-like substance, something which clings. It's also called as a congealed clot of blood. The Quran speaks about the various embryological stages in great detail, which modern embryology has just discovered recently in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 12 to 14. I'll just mention a couple more. Normally, the unbelievers do object that how can Almighty God, once we have died and we have been buried in the ground, in the dust, how will Almighty God be able to reassemble our bones after our bones have got disintegrated? On the Day of Judgment, how will we be able to reassemble the bones? And Almighty God says in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4, that He can not only reassemble the bones, He can even reassemble the very tips of the finger in perfect order. And it was in 1880 that Sir Francis Gold discovered the fingerprinting method and said that no two fingerprints, even in millions of human beings, even if millions of human beings together, no two fingerprints are identical. What the CIA, the police, the CID, the FBI, today they use the fingerprinting method to identify the criminal. Allah mentioned 1400 years ago. He can not only reassemble your bones, he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of your finger. When we ask the atheist, that who could have mentioned this in the Quran? The only reply he can give you is the creator. It is the manufacturer. It is the inventor. It is the maker. It is the producer. This creator, this manufacturer, this inventor, this maker, this producer, we Muslims, we call him as Allah. I have tried to summarize my two hours lecture of Is the Quran God's Word? in only approximately 15 minutes, so that we can have more time for question and session, just for the benefit of the multiple times number of people that are here. According to Albert Einstein, he said that Science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. Let me remind you, the glorious Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. It's a book of ayats. And in the glorious Quran, there are more than 6,000 signs more than 6,000 ayats, out of which more than 1,000 speak about science. I'm not trying to take the help of science to prove the authenticity of the Quran. For us Muslims, the Quran is a yardstick. But for the non-Muslims, for the atheist, for him, science is a yardstick. So I'm taking his yardstick and comparing with our yardstick and trying to prove that what your yardstick has mentioned yesterday, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back, our yardstick, the glorious Quran, has already mentioned 14 years ago. That's the reason today science is not eliminating God, but it is eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. So this glorious Quran has the solution to the problems of humankind. And its author is the creator, the sustainer, the cherisher of the whole humankind, of the whole universe. There were several revelations sent by Almighty God on the face of the earth. But all the revelations that came before the last and final revelation of the glorious Quran were meant only for a particular group of people, and it was meant to be followed only for a particular time period. But since the Quran was the last and final revelation of Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was sent for the whole of humankind. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, that Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed. 
as a criteria for judgment from right and wrong and as a guidance for the whole of humankind. Not only for the Muslims or for the Arabs, for the whole of humankind. The same message is repeated in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse 52, as well as Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse 41, that the Quran has been sent for the whole of humankind. Similarly, all the messengers that came before the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only sent for a particular group of people. And the message which they brought was meant to be followed only till a particular time period. But since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger, he was not sent only for the Muslims or for the Arabs. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ الْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to the whole of humanity, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the worlds. The same message is repeated in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا قَفَةَ لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَزِيرًا We have sent thee not, but as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the human beings yet do not know. And because most of the human beings yet do not know, that's the reason we are having such conferences and such lectures. But today, if we read, if we hear, if we notice the international media, there is virulent propaganda about Islam in the international media whether it be the international newspapers, the international magazines, the radio broadcast stations, the international TV channels, the international satellite channels, we find in the international media, they are spreading many misconceptions about Islam. There is virulent propaganda about Islam. And according to an article which came in the Newsweek magazine on 16th of April, 1979, it says that in the span of 150 years, from 1800 to 1950, more than 60,000 books have been written against Islam. And if we calculate, if we divide the number of days and number of books written, more than one book was written against Islam every day. And after 9-11, that 11th of September 2001, this has reached epidemic level. Every day, several books are written against Islam. If you want to get famous, if you write a book against Islam, the chances it will become a bestseller is high. And we notice that the international media, they use several strategies to spread these misconceptions about Islam. Number one is, they pick up the black sheep of the community and they portray as though they are exemplary Muslims. They are black sheep in every community. So what the media does, they pick up the black sheep amongst the Muslims. They are not actually practicing Muslims. They are namesake Muslims. They pick them up and they portray as though they are exemplary Muslims. If you want to know how good is the car, and if you put behind the steering wheel a person who does not know how to drive the car, and if he has an accident, if he bangs the car, who will you blame? Will you blame the car or the driver? Who will you blame? The car or the driver? But naturally, the driver. If you want to know how good the car is, you have to analyze the specification. What is the fuel consumption of the car? What is the speed? What is the gear ratio? What are the safety measures? After analyzing these, then can you judge how good the car is. And if you want to really test drive the car, put behind the steering wheel a person who is an expert driver. And if you want to judge Islam, how good Islam is, and you really want to analyze an exemplary Muslim, the best example, it is our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.
Look at his seerah. Analyze the history of the Prophet, and undoubtedly, you'll have to agree that this religion and the follower of this religion, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the major benefactor for the spreading of peace. Second strategy used is, many a times, they give quotations of the Quran and the religious scriptures of Islam out of context. And we find that many critics, if you read many of the books against Islam, if you go on the internet, many sites against Islam, and they give references from the Quran as well as the quotation. And one quotation which is very often used by the critics is of Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5. And this was also used by Arun Shori, one of the staunchest critics of Islam in this country, India. His name is Arun Shuri. And he writes in his book, The World of Fatwa, and he gives the reference that Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, and it tells the Muslims that wherever you find a kafir, into brackets he's indicating Hindus, he's saying that the Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, that wherever you find the kafir, you have to kill them. And if you read the Quran, if you open the Quran, and if you read the translation, what he's saying is correct. Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5 does say that wherever you find the kafir, you kill them. But it is quoted out of context. For context, you have to start from verse number 1 of Surah Tawbah, chapter 9. And when you read the context and know the background, why was this verse revealed? We come to know that there was a peace treaty between the Muslims and the Mushriks of Makkah. And this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah. So when this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah, Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He says in Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse number 2, that He is giving four months time. Otherwise, there is a declaration of war. As mentioned in Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse number 5, that after the four forbidden months, it tells the Muslims that you fight and you kill the pagans, that means your enemies, wherever you find them, and seize them and wait for them in every stratagem of war. So, in context, we come to know this verse was revealed in the battlefield. That in the battlefield, when the peace treaty is broken and when the enemies come to fight you, don't get scared, fight back and kill them where you find them. But natural, any army general in the battlefield to boost up the morale of the soldier, he will say, fight them. Suppose there's a war going on between US and Vietnam, and if the army general of USA, if he says, that wherever you find the Vietnamese, you kill them. But naturally, it's in context. But if I quote out of context and say that today, the Army General of America says that wherever you find a Vietnamese today, you kill them, I will make him sound like a butcher. <laughs> but naturally, to boost up the morale, Almighty God will not say that, OK, run away. To boost up the morale, he has to say that don't get scared, fight. And it's a fight between truth and falsehood. And such examples you'll find in the Bible. If you see in the Gospel of Matthew, you'll find in the Hindu scriptures, in Bhagavad Gita, full Bhagavad Gita speaks about that. That Lord Krishna, he is giving advice to Arjun. Arjun in the battlefield. He says in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number one, verse number 46, 47, 48. In the battlefield, he puts his weapons and says, I would prefer being killed unarmed than to fight my relatives. So Sri Krishna says, just a few verses later, in Bhagavad Gita chapter number 2, verse number 2 and 3, that, oh Arjun, how can you be so important? It is the duty of the Kshatriya, it is the duty of the warrior to fight. And only if you fight, will you go to the heavenly planet, to the paradise.
and it goes on and on. You can see my cassette on terrorism and jihad, where I've spoken in detail. But when the Quran speaks about this, non-Muslims have a problem. Imagine if I say that Bhagavad Gita is saying, kill your relatives. It will be devilish. And Bhagavad Gita does say that. If I say Bhagavad Gita says, kill your relatives, it will be devilish. In context, it says that when you have to fight against untruth, if you have to fight against oppression, stand for truth, even if it be against your relatives. And as far as this message of Bhagavad Gita is concerned, we are for it. Quran says the same. Therefore, to make the non-Muslims understand Islam, according to me, the master key given in the Quran by our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Sulal Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, which says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bayuna bayinakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. The best way to make the non-Muslims understand Islam and Quran is Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bayuna bayinakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but one almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Arun Shuri, after quoting verse number 5 of Surah Tawbah, he jumps to verse number 7. You know why? Verse number 6 has the answer to his sickness. Verse number 6 of Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9 says, that if any of the pagans, if any of the disbelievers, if any of your enemies seek asylum, if they want peace, grant it to them. So that they may hear the word of Almighty God and escort them to a place of security. Because these are men who do not understand. The Quran does not say just let them go. Today, if the enemy wants peace, maximum the army general will say, okay, let them go. Quran does not say that. Quran says, escort them to a place of security. Because these are men who do not understand. Just a few months back, when I was giving a similar example, there was a non-Muslim from the audience who said, Brother Zakir, even you are quoting out of context. You haven't quoted the full verse of Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5. That the full verse reads, after saying that in the battlefield, wherever you find the kafir, kill them and slay them, wait for them in every strategy number four. It continues and says, but if they repent and if they establish prayers, regular prayers and regular charity, then let them go. For Allah is forgiving and merciful. So he's telling, we come to know that only if they accept Islam do you have to leave them. See, many a time it becomes difficult for us to give the full explanation, otherwise the lecture will be maybe 10 hours long. As it is, people say that I'm a marathon speaker. But I thanked that Hindu brother and said, Jazakallah for giving me an opportunity for clarifying more. Verse number 5 of Surah Tawbah does refer that if the unbeliever, if he repents, and establish his regular prayer and give regular charity, indicating he becomes a Muslim, then let him go. If he becomes a Muslim, let him go. But verse number six says that if the unbeliever seeks asylum, wants peace, don't just let him go. Escort him to a place of security. If he becomes a Muslim, let him go. But if he does not become a Muslim and wants peace, Don't just leave him. Escort him to a place of security because maybe now he's in between, he's on the fence. Those who accept Islam find they're Muslims. He wants peace. Maybe the non-Muslims, they may kill him. Maybe the non-Muslim would like to take revenge. Why is he wanting for peace? So Almighty God says in the Quran, don't leave them. Escort them to a place of security. So that's the reason critics like Arun Shuri, they skip verses, they quote out of context, and you can give hundreds of such examples. If you go on the internet, it's very common. 
and we find now many of the non-Muslims, they go on the internet, and to speak against the Quran has become easy. Therefore, more books are being published. Very easy. You know, internet is a boon and a bane. Initially, when it started, there were more websites against Islam than for Islam. Now Muslims have caught up. There are good sites also. But you don't have to be a scholar to find alleged mistakes in the Quran. And it's difficult to reply. The moment you keep on replying, more and more keep on coming. That's the reason we have open question and answer sessions. So strategy number two is they quote the verses of the Quran and the Islamic scriptures out of context. Third strategy is they say things about Islam which are alien to Islam. It does not exist in Islam. For example, many critics say that Islam is an unscientific religion. Just to give you one example, time will not permit me to give several examples. Since nowadays we're having a controversy on the famous Bangladeshi writer, Taslima Nasreen. She says that the Quran mentions that the sun revolves around the earth. And if we have to believe in such an outdated book, how can the Muslims advance? And I challenge anyone to point out any verse of the Quran which says that the sun revolves around the earth. And I said this several years back when I had a debate about her in the Bombay Union of Journalists. What she's referring to is the verse of the Quran which I quoted earlier in my talk in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, which says, it is Allah who has created the night and the day, the sun and the moon, each one traveling in its own orbit. So here the Quran says that the sun is revolving in motion. Nowhere does the Quran say that the sun is revolving around the earth. It's her own understanding, her own interpretation. The word earth is not there in the verse of the Quran. The Quran says it is revolves in a motion which I explained earlier, the Quran says besides revolving, it also rotates. When I was in school, I didn't know about that. And now science has testified that. So many a time, the critics of Islam, they say things about Islam which are alien to Islam. And very often, fourth strategy used. They mention things about Islam, and after that they say that because of this, Islam is the problem for humanity. Today the problem that you have in the world is mainly because of Islam. And they say, Muslims are terrorists, they are fundamentalists, they are extremists, Islam is an intolerant religion. Because of all these things, Islam is a problem for humanity. And many a time, we Muslims are apologetic, which I would rather use the strategy of turn the tables over. And today, Muslims are called as fundamentalists. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist, by definition, means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular field. For example, if a person wants to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. For a person to be a good scientist, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he is a fundamentalist, in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. You cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. For example, if we have a fundamentalist robber whose profession is to rob, he's bad for the society. He's a bane for the society. On the other hand, if we have a fundamentalist doctor, who saves hundreds of human lives, he's a boon for the society. 
You can't paint all fundamentalists with the same brush that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field is the person a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. As far as I'm concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. Because I know, I strive, and I follow the principles of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam, not a single teaching of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be a few teachings of Islam which some non-Muslim may feel are against humanity. But the moment you give the logical reasoning, the statistics behind the teaching, there is not a single human being who is unbiased, who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. And this word fundamentalism was first coined according to the Webster Dictionary. It was used to describe the Protestant Christians in the early part of the 20th century in America. So this word first was used for the Americans for the Protestant Christians because they protested against the church. The church believed that the message of the Bible was from God. These Protestant Christians, they protested that not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If someone can prove that every letter, every word of the Bible is from God, this fundamentalism movement, it's a good movement. On the other hand, if someone can prove that every word of the Bible is not from Almighty God, then this movement is not a good movement. When we read the Oxford Dictionary, we find out, and it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion. But when I read one of the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary, there was a side change. It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion, especially Islam. So especially Islam has been added in the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary. The moment you see a Muslim, your mind goes that he's a fundamentalist. And we Muslims are apologetic. I'm not a fundamentalist. I say I'm a fundamentalist. What's the problem? You cannot be a good Muslim until you are a fundamentalist Muslim. The media says Muslims are extremist. I say yes, I'm an extremist. I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely loving, I'm extremely merciful, I'm extremely honest, I'm extremely just. What's wrong in being extremely kind, extremely merciful, extremely loving, extremely just, extremely honest? You can't be partly honest. When it benefits you, you're honest. When it does not benefit you, you aren't honest. According to the Quran, you have to be extremely kind, extremely merciful. If you are a Muslim, you have to be an extremist Muslim. You have to be extremely kind, you have to be extremely honest. You have to be extremely just. I want a single human being to tell me what is wrong in being extremely honest. You have to be extremist in the right direction. We Muslims should not be apologetic. No, 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 I'm a moderate Muslim. What's a moderate Muslim? Do you follow Islam or don't follow Islam? Allah says in the Quran, Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 208. You can't have to follow part of Islam. You have to be fully just. You have to be fully honest. Extremely honest. Today, Muslims are given the label that Muslims are terrorists. I say, in context, every Muslim, he should be a terrorist. What is the meaning of the word terrorist? Terrorist by definition means a person who causes terror. Whenever a criminal sees a policeman, he's terrified. So for the criminal, the policeman is a terrorist. In this context, in this context, every Muslim 
should be a terrorist to the criminal. Whenever any criminal sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any robber sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any rapist sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. If every Muslim is truly terrorist in the right way, terrorizing the criminals, then you will have the solution for humanity. If every human being becomes the fundamentalist Muslim, following the fundamentals of Islam, the problems of humanity will be solved. If every human being is an extremist Muslim, extremely kind, extremely loving, extremely honest, extremely just, the problems of humanity will be solved. Many a time, two different labels are given to the same individual for the same activity. For example, 60 years back, 70 years back, there were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country when the British were ruling India. These Indians, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But the same people, for the same activity, we common Indians, we call them as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government that they had a right rule over India, then you have to call these Indians as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, then you'll call these people as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. And we find several such examples in history, several. We know during the American Revolution in 1775, when the Britishers, when they occupied America, there were many Americans who were fighting for the freedom. And number one terrorist, according to the British government, was George Washington. George Washington, by the British government, was called as number one terrorist in 1775. Later on, he becomes the president of America, USA. Imagine, terrorist number one becomes the president of USA. And he happens to be the godfather of all the presidents to come, including George Bush. <laughs> and what are my comments on George Bush? You can see my tape, Terrorism and Jihad, an Islamic perspective. And we find several such examples. Before South Africa was free, it was ruled by the white apartheid government. This white apartheid government had imprisoned Nelson Mandela for more than 25 years in Robben Islands. And they said that he was terrorist number one. Later on, after the apartheid government was removed in South Africa, when the new government came, they released Nelson Mandela, and later on he got the Nobel Prize for Peace. Imagine terrorist number one getting Nobel Prize for Peace. Not that he was bad and then he became good, not that he killed many people and then he became good. For the same activity for which he was called terrorist number one, he was given the Nobel Prize for Peace. So what we come to know today, it's in the hands of the media. Whoever is in power, whatever label they give to a person, it gets stuck. Whether it's the truth or not, that is secondary. Whoever is in power, who has control of the media, what they portray about a person, that label gets stuck to that person. Therefore, before giving a label, first you have to identify for what reason that person was striving, and then give the label. And Quran clearly mentions in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Most of the religions say that killing innocent human being is wrong. Quran goes a step further and says that if you kill any innocent human being, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And it does not stop there. It goes further and says that if you save any human life, it is as though you have saved the whole of humankind. Most of the religious scriptures do say you should not kill innocent human being. Quran goes a step further and says that if you kill any innocent human being, you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you have saved any human being, you have saved the whole of humanity. Yet, Islam is called as an intolerant religion. 
and I do say that Islam is an intolerant religion. Islam is intolerant towards corruption. Islam is intolerant towards injustice. Islam is intolerant towards discrimination. Islam is intolerant towards dishonesty. Islam is intolerant towards racism. Islam is intolerant towards victimization. It is an intolerant religion. See, theoretically, all the countries say that dishonesty is wrong. All the countries and all the religions, they say corruption is wrong. All of the people, they say discrimination is wrong. They say racism is wrong. They say victimization is wrong. But that is only a theory in most of the countries. Most of the countries have corruption. There's dishonesty in most of the countries. So just because Islam is intolerant towards the practices which are prevalent in many countries, I do agree Islam is an intolerant religion. Islam is intolerant towards those things which Almighty God knows are wrong for the human being, which today many human beings feel it is a part and parcel of society. They think if you do these things, you are advanced. So Islam is intolerant to those things which the Creator feels is wrong, and many of the human beings today feel are right. Islam is intolerant towards alcoholism. Islam is intolerant towards drug addiction, towards pornography, towards prostitution, towards adultery, towards fornication. Islam is an intolerant religion. It's intolerant towards the evils of the society. Because if you're intolerant towards these things, then only will you have the solution to the problems of humanity. Many people go on the defense. Oh, Islam is not an intolerant religion. It is intolerant towards the vices. But tolerant towards the things which are good. It does not force anyone at the point of the sword. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 256, like Rafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Many people quote this and put a full stop. That's not the end of the verse. The verse continues. Like Rafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. You have to present the truth. If you want to accept it, accept it. If you don't want to accept it, no problem. No one can force you to accept Islam at the point of the sword or the point of the gun. In this way, it is the most tolerant religion. When we analyze most of the religions, they speak good things. So what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference between Islam and the other religions is that Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a way how to achieve that state of goodness. For example, most of the religions say that you should not rob. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says the same. So what is the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference is Islam, besides saying that you should not rob, it shows you a way how to achieve that state in which people will not rob. Islam has a system of zakat. One of the pillars of Islam is zakat, that every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that wealth every lunar year in charity to the poor people. If every rich human being gives charity, gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. Yet, even after no human being will die of hunger, yet there are people who yet want to rob to get wealth easily, to fulfill the desires which are wrong. Islam has a solution for that also. After zakat, Almighty God says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, as to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop of his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Non-Muslims will say chopping of the hands. In this 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. And they think that every second person you come across in Saudi Arabia, 
where this law is practiced, you will find that every second person will have his hand chopped off. I have been to Saudi Arabia several times, more than 20, 30 times. Never have I come across a single human being whose hands have been chopped off. Surely there will be some people whose hands may have been chopped off, but the law is so strict, a person will think a million times before robbing. Not that the police of Saudi Arabia is very intelligent, but the law is so strict that the moment you implement the law, you get results. The moment you make the law easy, if this law is relaxed in Saudi Arabia, robbery will start in Saudi Arabia also. And today, we look up to America as a country which is most advanced. Do you know it is a country which has one of the highest rates of theft and robbery? I'm asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in America and USA, that every rich person who has a saving of more than 85 grams of gold should give 2.5% of his excess wealth in charity, and after that, if any person robs, chop off his or her hand, I'm asking the question, will the rate of theft and robbery in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? Decrease. It will decrease. It's a practical law. It is not a very intelligent question that you have answered. It is simple logic. You implement the Sharia and you get results. So Islam is the only solution to the problems of humankind. Let me give you one more example. Most of the religions, they say, that it should not molest a woman, that it should not rape a woman. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says the same. So what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference is Islam, besides saying that it should not molest a woman, that it should not rape a woman, it shows you a way in which you can achieve a society in which there'll be no molestation, there will not be any rape. Islam speaks about the system of hijab. Most of the people talk about the hijab for the woman. But Almighty God in the Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that whenever he looks at a woman, if any brazen thought comes, any unashamed thought comes, he should lower his gaze. There was a Muslim person, Muslim man, who was staring at a girl for a long time. I told him, brother, what are you doing? It's not allowed in Islam. So he told me, our beloved prophet said that the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited, I have not completed my first glance. <laughs> what did the prophet mean that the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited? That does not mean you can look at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying, I have not completed my glance. What the prophet meant that unintentionally, if you look at a woman, do not look at her again to feast on her beauty. The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. Almighty God says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, Allah says, that say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what appears ordinarily of and draw her head covering over her bosom and display not her beauty except in front of her father, her brother, her husband, and a big list of maram, the close relatives who she cannot marry is given. In short, there are six criteria for hijab mentioned in the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad The first is the extent. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is the clothes they wear. It should not be tight so that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through the clothes. The fourth, the clothes should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And the Quran says in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 59, O Prophet, tell your wives, your daughters, and the believing woman, that when they go abroad, they should put on the jilbab, they should put on the overcoat, overcloak, so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. 
the Quran says hijab had been prescribed for the women so that they shall be recognized as modest and it will prevent them from being molested. I would like to ask a simple question. That, suppose there are twin sisters who are very beautiful, who are equally beautiful, and one of them, she is wearing the Western clothes, mini skirts or shorts. And the other twin sister, she is wearing the Islamic hijab, complete body covered, except the face and hands up to the wrist. And if they're walking down the streets of Bombay, maybe at Pedder Road or Napinsi Road, where we have many bird watchers, if they're walking down the streets of Pedder Road or Napinsi Road, and if round the corner, there's a hooligan who's waiting for a catch, who's waiting to tease a girl. I'm asking the question, which girl will he tease? Will he tease the girl wearing the mini skirt or shorts? Or will he tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab? Which girl will he tease? But naturally, the girl wearing the miniskirt. So Quran rightly says that hijab has been prescribed for the woman so that they shall be recognized that they're modest and it will prevent them from being molested. After that, the Islamic Sharia says, any man rapes any woman, he gets capital punishment, death penalty. Many non-Muslims will say, death penalty? In this age of science and technology, in the 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. But when you ask this question, and I've asked this question to thousands of non-Muslims, that God forbid, suppose someone rapes your mother, or someone rapes your sister, and if you are made the judge, and if the rapist is brought in front of you, what punishment will you give to that rapist? And believe me, 100%, 100% of the non-Muslims, they said, we will put him to death. Some went to the extreme of saying, we will torture him to death. There was only one smart Alex when I went to USA. He told me, the brother Zakir, I will give him five years imprisonment. I said, fine. Then I told him that according to the statistics of America, out of those people who are convicted for rape and they are given imprisonment, when they come out, 95% rape again. So if you want your mother to be raped again, you're most welcome. We Muslims don't want that. So he told me, if that is the case, then I would give him death penalty as the first shot. Today, America, we look up to America as the most advanced country in the world. Do you know it is a country which has one of the highest rate of rape? According to the statistics of the FBI in 1990 alone, every day, 1,756 rapes took place. Again, repeated in 1996. It says that every day, on an average, 2,713 cases of rape took place in America. That means every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place in America. We are here for one and a half hour. Already more than 100 rapes may have taken place in America since the time we are here. I'm asking you the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in America, that any man looks at a woman, if any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. After that, every woman, she should be modestly dressed, complete body covered, except the face and hands up to the wrist. And after that, if any man rapes a woman, he gets capital punishment, death penalty. I'm asking you the question, will the rate of rape in America, will it increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease? It will decrease. Easy question, easy answer. You don't have to be a scholar to know this. You implement the Sharia, and you get results. But because Islam gives the solution, it does not go down the throat. But a few years ago, the Home Minister of India, L.K. Adwani, he had said in the parliament, and he proposed that in India also, there should be death penalty for the rapist. And I congratulate him for that. I may not agree with his other policies, but as far as this policy is concerned, I agree with him that death penalty for the rapist. Maybe the next Home Minister will say that every woman in India should have the hijab on, inshallah. <laughs> if you want no rape to take place in India, anywhere in the world, whether it be America, UK, you implement the Sharia, you'll get the results immediately. That's the reason the least rate of rape in any country in the world is in Saudi Arabia. Any country which implements the Islamic Sharia 
Whatever part they implement, they get results. Whatever part they don't implement, they don't get results. Today we find that the religion of Islam, it is said to be a religion which degrades the woman, which subjugates the woman. For the complete answer, you can refer to my video cassette, Women Rights in Islam. Time does not permit me to speak in detail. But if we analyze today, the Western society claiming to uplift the woman is actually they are degrading the woman. The Western talk of women's liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of deprivation of honor, degrading a soul, as well as exploitation of a body. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman have actually degraded her to a status of concubine, mistresses, and society butterflies, which are mere tools in the hands of pleasure seekers hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. In the name of art and culture and women's liberalization, what is the Western world doing? They are selling our daughters, they are selling our mothers, they are selling our sisters. And India, after a few years, what the Western country does, we find India is following that. Follow the good things, I've got no problem. You know, when I was in school, more than 20 years back, most of the newspapers, they were clean. You could hardly find any obscene photographs. But now, if you pick up any newspaper, whether leading newspaper, daily newspaper, most of them, almost all, they have to have obscene photographs in it. Even on the sports page, what do they have? Football star. Then they show the girlfriend. Now, what does the girlfriend want to do with football? They want to sell the paper. Women's liberalization. Ronald, do you know what's the name? I don't know all the names of the football stars. And then they show the girlfriend. Then you find a cricketer, and then they show the girlfriend. So even on the sports page, if there's no news of women, then they show the girlfriend. Invariably, all the newspapers, and many newspapers have supplements. Supplements, like Times of India, the most famous newspaper. It's the largest selling English newspaper of the world. Largest selling daily newspaper of the world. It has a supplement called Bombay Times. And people of Bombay know what is Bombay Times famous for, especially page number three. <laughs> and this was a strategy. And I do agree. After getting this strategy, the sale of Times of India has increased. I'm not against Times of India only. I'm talking about Times of India because that's the paper I read daily. You talk about any other newspaper, DNA, Hindustan Times, Indian Times, up or down, less or more, you'll find these women who are semi-nude in the name of women's liberalization. So I used to tell my vendor, my newspaper man, that only give me Times of India. I don't want Bombay Times. He's saying, Saab, you're free, hey, free. Move off me. I said, if you give me Bombay Times, I won't pay you money. He's telling me, free, free. Don't worry, sir, it is free. I said, I don't want it. Only give me the main newspaper. That I mentioned a few years back. But today, even in the main newspaper, you have women. Either on the sports page, either on international news, either on the front page. Somewhere there you'll find, no wonder the selling of most of the newspapers have increased. And we find in the name of women liberalization, in the name of art and culture. In ads, you'll find most of the ads have got women. If you see an ad of a motorcycle, whether it be abroad or whether it be in India, how many women ride motorcycle? How many? Percentage is less than 1%. In India, less than 1% abroad also. But invariably, in a motorcycle ad, you'll find a woman. For what? And I was told about the very famous BMW ad. You know, BMW car is very famous. The BMW car, the car which has a status is Mercedes. But for the youngsters, the BMW is famous. It has a good pickup, it's a faster car. So someone told me that one of the ads of BMW, it had a girl in a bikini in front of the car, and the caption was, test drive her now. Who, the girl or the car? What are we doing? 
Are you selling your daughters, your mothers, your sisters? Islam does not believe in such kind of liberalization. If you say this is liberalization, we are happy with what we are. We love our sisters, we love our mothers, we love our wives. We love them, we respect them, and we want to protect them. And we give them equal rights. For more details about rights of women in Islam, refer to my video cassette, Women's Rights in Islam. I would like to end my talk by trying to clarify the last misconception that Islam was spread by the sword. If you translate, peace was spread by the sword. Peace was spread by the sword. And you have noticed that in the exhibition, in the panels, we had certain common misnomers. Common misnomers like the world is flat. You have a square triangle. Two plus two is equal to five. Islamic terrorism is the same. How the world is not flat, it's a common misnomer. Two plus two is not equal to five. Similarly, Islam and terrorism is exactly the opposite. But it's a very common misconception. And the reply was given very well by Dilesi O'Leary, a very famous historian, in the book Islam at the Crossroad on page number eight. And he says that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword, is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. It is the most absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. And we know from history that we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. We did not force anyone at the point of the sword, neither did we do our message, we didn't convey the message. Later on, the Crusaders came, they wiped off the Muslims. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the Azan. If we wanted, we could have forced everyone to accept Islam at the point of the sword, but we didn't do it. We Muslims, the Arabs, we have been the lord of the Arab lands for the past 1400 years. For a few years, the British has came, for the few years, the French came, but overall, we have been the lord of the Arab land for the past 1400 years. Yet today, there are more than 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means the Christians in generations. These 14 million Arab Coptic Christians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was inspired at the point of the sword. We Muslims, we ruled this great country, India, for about a thousand years, the Mughals. If we wanted, we could have forced every Indian to accept Islam at the point of the sword. But we didn't do it. Today, more than 80% Indians, they are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was inspired at the point of the sword. Today, the country which has the largest population of Muslims in Indonesia, which army went to Indonesia? Which army went to Malaysia, which has more than 50% Muslims? Which army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? It is the sword of the intellect. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, Udu ila sabili rabbika bhalikma, wal mu'azit al hasna, wajad in billat ahasan. Invite all to the way of their Lord with the wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. It is the sword of the intellect which is conquering the hearts. It's not the sword of steel. It is the sword of reasoning and understanding which is winning over people. According to an article which came in the Plain Truth magazine, which was repeated in the Reader's Digest Almanac Yearbook 1984, it gave the statistics of the increase in the major world religions in a span of 50 years, from 1934 to 1984. And number one religion which increased the maximum was Islam, 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I'm asking the question, which war took place in the span of 50 years from 1934 to 1984, which forced millions of human beings to accept Islam? Which war? Which sword? It's a sword of intellect, sword of reasoning. Today, 
according to statistics. The fastest growing religion in America and USA is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. I'm asking the question, who is forcing these Americans to accept Islam? Who is forcing the Europeans to accept Islam? And when the media says that Islam is subjugating the women, do you know out of those people who are accepting Islam in the world, about two thirds, more than 65%, they are women. More than 65% who are accepting Islam in America, they are women. More than 65% who are accepting Islam in Europe, they are women. I'm asking you the question. If Islam subjugates the women, then why are the American women accepting Islam? Why are the European women accepting Islam? Why are the Indian women accepting Islam? Why? Because Islam has the solution for the problem of womankind. They have seen the world. When they see the world, they find that Islam is the only solution for the problems of womankind. And today we find, as I mentioned earlier, that there is virulent propaganda about Islam. On the media, we find that they are spreading misconceptions. But the more they're doing that, we find after 9-11, this has reached epidemic levels, writing against Islam, misconception about Islam, the propaganda against Islam increased. But I believe in the verse of the Quran of Surah Imran, chapter number three, verse number 54, where Allah says, Makrub Allah wallahu khairul makreen, that they planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planners. After 9 11, the amount of propaganda they're doing against Islam, do you know? After 9-11, the spread of Islam has increased. Only in a span of 10 months, in USA alone, after 9-11, more than 34,000 Americans accept Islam. In Europe alone, more than 22,000 accepted Islam in 10 months' time after 9-11. And I go to Europe. I go to UK very often, I go to America, and I find that after 9-11, when I give talks, there are more Americans coming for my talk. There are more Europeans coming for my talk. It's good. They want to know what kind of religion is this. Some come to attack, some come to learn. We welcome both of them. We welcome both of them. I like people who attack with reasoning. I love them. And we know Hazrat Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, was one of the staunchest enemies of Islam. And the Prophet prayed for his hidayah, he got hidayah, and then he became one of the staunchest supporters of Islam. That's the reason when Muslim youngsters say that death to George Bush, I said, don't say death to George Bush, say, may Allah give hidayah to George Bush. And we find that the more they're attacking Islam, the more Islam is spreading. See? After 9-11, the crowd is increasing, even here. And we find even in Bombay, non-Muslims are coming. Previously, we used to give chance to anyone to ask a question. Since the last few years, in my talks, non-Muslim first preference. But the Muslims complain that they never get a chance. And even today, inshallah, the first chance will be non-Muslims only, inshallah. Allah gives the promise in the glorious Quran in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. In Surah Fatah, chapter 48, verse number 28. As well as in Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse number 9. Who allazi arsala rasulahu biluda wa deen al-haq liyuzir ala deen kulli. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life, over all the other isms. However much the disbelievers don't like it. And enough is Allah as a witness. This deen, this religion of peace, submitting our will to Almighty God, is the only solution for the problems of humankind. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran from Sulay al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, which says, In the deen, in the lail Islam, Allah the Creator in the last and final revelation says that, In the deen, in the lail Islam, the only way of life, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is peace 
acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. Wa akhir dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Takbir. Jazakallah khair brothers and sisters for your patient and progressive kind of approach to this huge gathering that is collected here. Now we would have the open question and answer session. We would request you to kindly maintain the peaceful and calm atmosphere. Dr. Zakir will be answering your questions. We would like everyone to know there's an estimated more than 100,000 people collected here. I think more than 75% are Muslims. Are they peaceful or not? Are they disciplined or not? You pick up one or two people as terrorists, you cannot present them as examples. This is an example for the people of India, for the people of the world watching on Peace TV. See, we are so well disciplined. And we can analyze our topics and debate our topics critically, realistically. And we also have open question and answer forums as now. We start with the open question and answer session in which you are welcome to ask any question on the topic, is peace or is Islam the solution for humanity? We have three microphones arranged on the ground, one next to the stage on my left, and one on my left in the rear section for the brothers, and we have one microphone in the rear section arranged for the sisters. The ladies can put forward the question from that microphone. Your question has to be on the topic, it must be brief and to the point. This is question time for you, not a lecture time. Please note. You may ask only one question at a time and then go back at the queue and await your second chance. As Dr. Zakir had just mentioned, we will allow non-Muslims first preference. They would have preference over Muslim brothers to put forward their question and they can move ahead in the queue. The volunteers would help you to come in the front ahead of the Muslim brothers or sisters and put forward your question. I would request our non-Muslim brothers and sisters, feel free, feel safe. We are your brothers and sisters in analyzing this topic. We are your protectors. We are your custodians for this lecture in a very peaceful manner. May we have the first question from the ladies section. The sisters will give them a first chance. And you may kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your question so that Dr. Zakir can give a more appropriate and relevant response. Yes, sister. I'm Mrs. Bhavna Ansari. So kindly please bear with me and please excuse me humbly and peacefully. I have been born in a Jain society, living in a Hindu society, educated in a pure convent, and married a Muslim. I have married as per the Indian Marriage Act. And I'm staunchly, eagerly waiting to accept Islam as my wholehearted religion. But please, my brothers and sisters, what you preached, what you said about Islam, I'm very thankful to you for enlightening me. I am really reborn today, but what you preach and what you say and what is in Islam, excuse me, I don't find people practicing that wholeheartedly. They are not attracting me. Can you please give me a solution? Because when you speak of fundamentalism in Islam, it is positive. When you speak of uh, intolerance, it's positive. But in practice, I don't find. So can you please guide me? Sister, that's a very good question. First of all, I'd like to congratulate her, and I welcome her, and as she says, she's reborn. The right word in Islam is revert. Well, according to our beloved Prophet Muhammad every child is born in dunal fitr. 
is born as a Muslim. Muslim means a person who submits his will to Almighty God. Every human being initially, when he's born, he submits his will to Almighty God. Later on, the Prophet said that he's influenced by the parents, by the elders, by the teachers. Then he may become a fire worshipper, may go on the wrong track. So therefore, when a person comes back to the original faith, to Deen al-Fitr, the right word is not convert, not reborn, it is revert. So, sister, I welcome you back to this faith of peace and submitting a will to Almighty God. As far as question is concerned, that you have heard the lectures and you agree with the points, you have read about Islam, but your own objection is that Muslims, or most of the Muslims according to you, they are not following the teachings. What is the solution? Sister, I do agree with you. I do agree with you that many don't follow, but according to statistics, the religion, which is the maximum followed, I'm not talking in numbers. If you count the heads, those who profess a religion, number one would be Christianity, somewhere close to 2 billion. Islam, 1.3 billion to 1.4 billion. But the percentage which practices and follows the religion, maximum is Islam, number one. Maximum. But yet, I do agree with you that in terms of numbers, because 1.3 billion followers, even if it be a small percentage, the numbers will run in millions of Muslims don't follow the religion. Therefore, sister, to understand Islam, don't look at Muslims, please. And I always say, to understand a religion, don't look at the followers of the religion, but look at the authentic sources. Please don't look at me. Don't look at the Muslims around you. And I gave you the example of the car and the driver. If you want to know how good the car is, and if a person who does not know how to drive sits behind the steering wheel, and he has an accident, he bangs up the car, who will you blame, the car or the driver? You'll blame the driver. So please don't understand Islam by looking at the Muslims. That's the reason we are giving these lectures for both Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Those Muslims who have shortcomings, we are trying to get them closer to the truth. Because they may be namesake Muslims, we are trying to make them practicing Muslim. At the same time, we are delivering the message of Islam to the non-Muslims also, so that you understand this religion. And though you were born, you were born in a Jain family, and you had non-Muslim around you, you're married to a Muslim, but today, maybe after hearing the lecture, and after learning about Islam, you have come back to the faith. And as you said that previously, maybe only for the sake of name, you may have adopted the surname Ansari, but today, you have come back to this true faith. And we congratulate you. And please, sister, if you want to look at a Muslim, to understand Islam, the best example is the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This book, the Quran, and the things of the Prophet have the solution for the problems of humanity. Don't look at the Muslims. Some Muslims may be close to Islam, some may be far away from Islam. So look at the main source. Understand it, follow it. Inshallah, you'll get peace in this world as well as the hereafter. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you, sister, for your question. Yes, brother. Sir, my name is Professor Sethi. I am an engineer by profession and I'm into a teaching profession. By God's grace, I'm very strong in my maths. Uh, to start with, I appreciate your hard work and pray to God to give you double your age God has allotted you. And I thank all the Muslims here for giving me first priority to ask my question. Sir, I've gone through Bhagavad Gita, I've gone through Ramayana being Hindu. I was after temples and everything. But my brother-in-law is a Muslim. He gave me Quran. I've gone through it twice. And I can say in open, I'm following your Quran very strictly. I have converted your namaz into English in the name of God, the most gracious and the most merciful, the creator, cherisher, sustainer of the worlds, the master of the day of judgment. I am reading it 12 times, 15 times, 20 times. I don't see timings. I just stand and pray to God and uh, I am very satisfied with that. The only one question I am not getting it, my source of income. Being very strong in maths, I am also a technical analyst with stock market. I am very strong with FNO market, future and option. I don't know how many people understand the stock market here. With a very intellectual mathematics and very intellectual playing the game, 
I am always secure and always in profit after the end of the month. It's a mathematic game which people don't understand. Is it okay to go ahead with such income? I'm suffering from this last three years. I'm, I'm, I'm earning money, I can earn money, whatever level I want to earn. But I'm very, I, I don't want to earn anything wrong. If it is wrong, I will leave that forever. And I will go into teaching profession forever. Alhamdulillah. Because that's a very good question. And I appreciate that after reading the Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana and the Hindu scriptures, he read the Quran twice and he agrees with it. He has a brother-in-law who's a Muslim and he's very strong in maths. And even I happen to be strong in maths. And in school days, right from standard one to standard nine, ten, always back the price. Without price. saying, sir, mind-boggling memory, I've never seen a person like you. It's and God if, God, if God grace, I will be at, the, at your place forever. If the God, agar Ishwar ki marzi hui, Allah ki marzi hui, to yes. aapka shish Insh banunga isi platform par. Inshallah, Inshallah. <laughs> if Allah will, Inshallah. First I'll come to the question and then Inshallah I'll reply to his last comment. As far as your question is concerned, that you are in the stock market, about futures and options, etc. And you are so good in maths and analyzing, that always at the end of the month you make a profit. So the question is that, is this earning halal or haram? As far as the stock market is concerned, stock per se is not haram, per se. As long as the stocks you deal in, it is according to the guidelines of Islam. What is haram in Islam is riba, it's interest. There are many verses in the Quran, no less than eight different places, Almighty God says in the Quran that riba is haram. In Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 130. In Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 161. In Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 275, thrice. In Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 276. As well as in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 278. It says that give up your demands of riba, of interest, of usury. And those who do not give up the demands of riba and usury, verse number 279, Allah says, take notice of Allah from Allah and His Rasul, Allah and His Messenger. So dealing in interest is haram, but share market is somewhat following the principles of Islam of profit and loss sharing. Share per se, instead of taking a loan from the bank, we make partners. Because the banking system makes a rich person more rich, poor person more poor. It encourages things evil in society, like in 80s, the banks fund gambling dens, alcohol bars, and Islamic system is different, Islamic banking is different. So, Islam encourages profit and loss sharing. In the stock market, what do you do? That you buy a share. So you become a partner in that company. Whether 1%, 10%, 0.1%, 0.01%. 1 so being partner in profit and loss sharing is encouraging Islam. So if you're dealing in stock market and shares, as long as it is within the purview of the Islamic Sharia, as long as you do not buy shares of a company which deals in alcohol, company which deals in interest, financial companies, whether it be banks, whether it be financial instrument companies, company which deals in media obscenity, pornography. So all the evils of society, if the company you invest in is not investing in the evil of society, alcoholism or drugs or drug, pharmaceutical companies are allowed. Huh? Drugs means cocaine and brown sugar. Or we living with obscenity, it may be film industry. So if you buy shares of these companies, it's haram. Secondly, if you involved in speculation, that is gambling, you know, you being in the stock market, people buy now, after two minutes again they sell, because of prior information or because of, you know. So gambling is prohibited in Islam. So if your stock market is good, you want to invest in it, you want to stay for good, be a partner, make, and even I'm involved in stock market. And... So you're not replying to the right point I'm asking. It is futures and options. That's it is put I'm in call. You, I'm you, coming to you it. You can just pay 10 rupees and buy stocks for 100 rupees and you keep it for years and years, years together. I'm coming to it. Yes, sir. I like giving a holistic reply rather than... Okay. Thanks, Lord, sir. Sorry for disturbing. Now, coming to the futures option, that you buy part of the shares and you deal with it, etc. Talking about futures, if you pay part and have it with you, I know you can sell, then you can have security on that, then there's another person with the derivatives, which can even, I know about this. I may not be an expert like you, but even this is. 
So dealing in futures, it's not permitted. It's not. Margin trading in certain things like real estate, you buy 10% of that, and then it increases because you have to make timely payment if you buy a flat, suppose. The payment time is two years. You pay 10% now, 20% later, the rates go up. You sell, that's fine. But in shares, it doesn't work like that. In future, it doesn't work like that. So because you don't possess it in your hands, you have paid part of the money, and then someone else backs you up, that if it goes down, then they hedge it. You know hedging? They hedge it. So all these things are not permitted in Islam. But pure stock, as long as the thing which you deal in, if it's Islamic, it's allowed. And you ask me the question, that all these things that you get, you get a large money income, if it's not allowed, you wouldn't like it. See, the money that you earn, as you said, if it's not permitted, you stop it. So what we are interested, we are interested in peace in this world and the akhirah. The peace in the next world is a longer peace. So if you're earning the halal, inshallah, you'll get good in this world as well as in the akhirah. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your peace and success in this world as well as in the akhirah in the next world. Hope that answers the question. Thanks a lot. Thanks for, I appreciate it for giving you so much of time. And definitely I will be following it strictly, sir. Thank you. Yes, brother. My name is Abhishek. When I was 14, I ran from my home, fighting my family. A man from Saudi take me to Kerala. Uh, he teach me Islam. Two years before, I accepted Islam. Now also I am accepting in Islam in front of all. Ashad an la ilaha illallah, Ashad anna Muhammad an abdu wa rasul. Your question, brother? Any question you have for Dr. Zakir? No, sir. Dr. Zakir would like to comment on that. Dear brother, I welcome you and I congratulate you to the religion of peace. And surely you can testify that no sword was used by that Saudi. Did he use any sword on you, brother? No. Any force? No. Any gun? No. I otherwise, accepted from my heart. Masha, otherwise the IB will question me. <laughs> Masha Allah. I would like to give you a translation of the Quran. If you can come on the stage, because I remember the first time I gave a talk eight days back, there was a sister there who accepted Islam. Believe me, I can't see the face. I can only see the face of the questioner who's on my left, on the first mic. I can't see your face. I can't see the face of the lady who accepted on the first day, on Saturday. The IB came questioning, the intelligence, that where is that lady? I said, I don't even know her face. Maybe on the television you saw her. The gathering is so vast. So surely the people on the television who see your face haven't seen your face. So you can testify to the people that there was no force used on you and no one can use force on you to accept Islam. If you like it with your heart and this country of ours, this country, India, is one of the few countries in the world in whose constitution is mentioned that every citizen of India has the right to preach, practice and propagate his religion. It is a democratic country but I'm proud of this country that we have the right to preach, practice, and propagate religion. Forcing anyone to accept any religion is prohibited. It's not only prohibited in the Indian government law, it is prohibited even in Islam. You can't force anyone to accept the religion of Islam. You deliver the message if he accepts good, if he doesn't accept also no problem. Because we can at least testify to Almighty God on the Day of Judgment that we delivered the message of peace to you. Thank you, brother, for accepting the religion of peace. Thank you very much. Yes, any sister on the mic? Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Pooja. I'm a physiotherapist. Uh, sir, during your oration, you uh, just uh, said these lines. I would just like to repeat them. Uh, you said, every person who is an extremist Muslim, the problems of the humanity will be solved. I would just like to make a correction. I'm too young to correct you, sorry for that. But uh, from the core of my heart, I believe this sentence would have been more authentic if we put it this way. Every person who is an extremist, the problems of the humanity will be solved. May so ever, he is a Muslim, a Hindu, a Christian, whosoever. Dr. Pooja has asked a very good question. And sister, if I'm wrong, I'm ready to accept the mistake. 
The question and answer is meant for that. If I say by mistake 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, you have a right to correct me. It's not 5, it's 4. I'm a human being. I'm not a human computer. I'm a human being. I can make mistakes. That's the reason we have open question and session. But coming to your comment, I said that if everyone would have an extremist Muslim, the problem would have solved. And you corrected me by saying that if we would have said that every human being would have been an extremist, the problem would have solved. Extremist in which way? An the extremist. Way, the way you said. Yes. Extremist, the way you said, to be extremely kind, extremely lovable. Sister, if you heard my talk, I said an extremist Muslim is a person who is extremely kind, extremely merciful, extremely loving, extremely honest, extremely just. Otherwise, they can be an extremist robber. Who wants to rob? They can be an extremist rapist. So if I just say extremist, the problem will be solved, the rapist will be happy with me. They say I'm an extremist rapist, you know. I'm an extremist terrorist. In the wrong sense, not terrorizing the antisocial element, terrorizing the innocent human being. Because normally the word terrorist is used to terrorize the innocent human being. In this context, no Muslim should ever be a terrorist. So sister, if you translate the full into English, you'll understand more correctly. What I meant was that if every human being becomes an extremist Muslim means, if every human being becomes an extremist, peaceful person, submitting his will to God, then the problems of humanity will be solved. Now, because I use the Arabic word, it does not go down the throats of many people. I'm not talking about you, sister. No, no, no. I'm talking about the media. When I say Islam, Muslim, it doesn't go down the throat. So I would like to rephrase the question for the benefit of the non-Muslims. If every human being becomes an extremely peaceful person, submitting his will to Almighty God, the problems of humanity will be solved. May so ever he is Muslim, Hindu or Christian. Now if you add may so ever he is Hindu, Muslim, Christian, rapist, robber, then the formula doesn't work, sister. Because if you say may so ever he be a Muslim, if he submits his will to Almighty God, he has to be a Muslim. And if a and Hindu submits to God, he is not very acceptable good. by God. No, He's no, no. Not like that. Yes, sister, wait, let me, you ask a second question, I give a second answer. No, sir. You are perfectly right. What is the definition of the word Hindu, sister? Hindu is a geographical definition, meaning those people living in the land of India. In that definition, I'm a Hindu, sister. I'm a Hindu Muslim, by geographical definition. But this word Hindu was first used by the Arabs when they came to India. When I go to Saudi Arabia, they say Hindi, Hindi, Hindu. You know? So this Hindu actually is a geographical definition, but today it is used as a misnomer to describe as a religion. According to Swami Vivekananda, he says that the followers should actually be called as Vedantist because they follow the Vedas. So Hindu is a misnomer. You ask any scholar. So if you say, can a Hindu be a Muslim? Geographical definition. I am a Hindu, I am living in India, I submit my will to God, I am a peaceful person. But everyone, but, but, sister, even the Americans can be good. Even the English can be good. If I say everyone in the world should live in India, as it is there is population, as it is there are more than one like million people. I would reframe my question, Sister, sir. please let me complete the answer. You asked a question, I am giving the answer. You asked a question, I am giving the answer. We will give you a second chance, no problem, sister. Surely. But at least let me clarify. Therefore, the words that you use, you should understand the meaning of the word. If every human being should live in India, then the Indian government will have a problem. As it is, they say, hum do, hamare do, ek ke baad abhi nahi, do ke baad kabhi nahi. They are talking about family planning. We two and our two. Hum do, hamare do, ek ke baad abhi nahi, do ke baad kabhi nahi. Means after one, let there be a gap. After two, you should not at all produce family planning. You can hear my answer in Quran Modern Science. So sister, therefore the words that you speak, if it's not in English, people sometimes have a confusion. So if you're a Hindu, submitting a will to God, submitting and following the Vedas, if you see my talk, sister, on similarities between Islam and Hinduism, the Vedas say that you should believe in one God. If you follow the Vedas, it's mentioned in Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one, it says, that God is only one without a second. 
It's mentioned in the Veda, Yajurve chapter number 32, verse number 3. Nata Sripatamasti. Of that God, there is no Pratima. Pratima means image, statue, sculpture, photograph. Of that Almighty God, according to Veda, there are no images, there are no photographs, there are no sculptures, there are no statues. If you are such a Hindu, it's mentioned in the Veda of another messenger to come, the final messenger whose name is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He is prophesied in the Kalki Avatar, chapter number 2, verse number 5, verse number 7, verse number 9, verse number 11, verse number 15, that this Kalki Avatar, he will be born in the city of peace, that is Makkah. His father's name shall be Vishnu, Yash, servant of God, translated Abdullah, which was the name of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, father. His mother's name shall be Sumati, means peaceful, serenity. In Arabic, it's Amina, which was the name of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's mother. He will be born on 12th month of Madhav. We know he was born on 12th of Biawal. He'll have four companions. The first for Khulfa Rashidin. I can go on and on and on. I've given a lecture on similarities between Islam and Hinduism. What I say, sister, that let us agree that at least one book is the word of God. Hindus will say that the Veda is the word of God. Christian will say Bible is the word of God. Muslim will say Quran is the word of God. Let us at least agree to follow what is common in the scriptures. Come to common terms as we now send you. Now what is not common, sister, let's not fight on that. We'll discuss that tomorrow. Fine? So let us agree, all the religious scriptures, all the major religious scriptures, whether it be the Bible, whether it be the Veda, whether it be the Quran, whether it be the Parsi scriptures, whether it be the Sikh scriptures, they say you have to believe in one God. Most of the major religions, they prophesy the coming of the last and final messenger. It's mentioned even in the Bible, in Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. Book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 19. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. It's prophesied in the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. In the New Testament, Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12, verse 14. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that he hears shall he speak. So what we come to know from all these major scriptures, that you have to believe in one God, who has got no images, who has got no idols. You have to believe in the last and final messenger. So let us agree, sister. Let's not fight on the differences. Let's agree to follow what is common in the Hindu scriptures, in the Parsi scriptures, in the Christian scriptures, you're talking Hindu Muslim, I'm talking about Parsiism, I'm talking about Islam. Let us agree to follow what's common, and inshallah, all the human beings who believe in God, they'll have to agree that one God who has got no images, who has got no statues, and have to believe that one last and final messenger has to come, whose name is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Then we will have every human being should be an extremely peaceful person, submitting his will to Almighty God, then the problem of humanity will be solved. Hope that answers the question, sister. Yeah, thank you, sir. We have brother Abhishek, who had just asked the previous question. He's already at the back of the stage, and he doesn't want to miss the opportunity to receive Quran from Dr. Zakir Naik. We allow him to accept it. Yes. Takbir. The brother came at the back of the stage and he was requesting the volunteers, I would like to receive. Alhamdulillah, we said we accept it. Yes, brother, the next question. Jakir Bhai, I will ask a question in Hindi. These are the Muslim brothers and sisters, so their feelings will be hurt. I will forgive you. My name is Mahesh Mehta, and I am a businessman. This is not a book of God, it is not a book of God. Why? Because ये जो तोरेत जबूर इंजील जो भेजा तोरेत मुसा इलाही सलाम को भेजा जबूर दाऊद इलाही सलाम को भेजा और ईसा इलाही सलाम को तो इंजील दिया तो ये अभी जो प्रेजेंट फॉर्म में नहीं है तीनों किताब ये लोग ने गड़बड़ कर दिया ऐसा बोलते हैं मुस्लिम जो भी आप लोग दूसरा बात ये भी है कि जो कुरान में पीपल ऑफ द बुक पीपल ऑफ द बुक कई बार कहते हैं यहूदी लोग और ईसाई लोग को तो जो जो अपना अल्लाह रहेगा तो खुद अपना मैसेज देगा जैसा कृष्णा भगवत गीता में बोलता है ये करो ये नहीं करो तो ये किताब कोई आदमी ने लिखा है और जो ट्वेंटी फाइव जो प्रॉफिट्स हैं जो बाइबल में हैं पूरे वो सब वही कुरान में है तो ये क्या है ये जो अभी जो इतना बड़ा अल्लाह है जो पूरा यूनिवर्स उसने बनाया है 
तो ये बात नहीं बोलेगा कि ये यहूदी लोग ये ईसाई लोग मतलब यहूदी ईसाई लोग को भी वो जानता था ये आदमी का ही काम है मेरे हिसाब से ऐसा मुझे लगता है एंड आई वॉन्ट टू आस्क अदर क्वेश्चन ऑल्सो वन मिनट यू नो आई I travel to so Let him answer the first question, ah, okay, then okay. we will allow you a second okay, one, brother. Okay. Brother asked the question. He says, and I know Mahesh Bhai, he's been coming to IRF since 1991. Ah. And he takes more video cassettes from IRF even than the Muslims. So his list in IRF, taking maximum number of video cassettes, literature, etc. Mahesh Bhai asked the question that as the earliest scriptures, as the Quran says, Torah, Zabur, Injil, revealed to Moses, David, Jesus Christ, peace be upon them, that the Muslim said has changed. So in the Quran, when the Quran speaks about the Jews, that, oh, people of the book, Jews and Christians. So when it speaks about in such a way, so isn't the Quran also written by the human beings? Correct? Your argument is that how does it speak about the Jews and Christians? Brother, if you had come for my earlier talk, is the Quran God's word? Were you there for the talk? No, I, I oh. was not. That talk dealt with this topic in detail. I don't intend repeating the full talk. And it dealt in detail that how people allege Prophet Muhammad wrote it, being a human being, for what reason, for power, for gain, etc. I know two hours lecture, which I can't repeat. But coming to your main question, that because it says that, oh, people of the book, it's telling. So that means it indicates written by a human being. Brother, if you analyze in the Quran, as you rightly said, that there are 25 messengers mentioned my name. And most of the messengers mentioned of Almighty God, they are Jewish. And if you see these names also mentioned in the Bible, about more than one third of the Quran is addressed to the Jews. Why? Giving examples that Almighty God did favors to the people of Israel, Yabani Israel. Don't you know the favors we did unto you, but you did so and so, so and so thing. So these are examples given in the Quran by Almighty God. That there were prophets who came earlier to these people. Some people rejected the prophet, some people accepted the prophet. So when it is giving an example, it says, Kul, ya hilal kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa imbayna baynakum. Come to common terms as been us and you. So the Quran is telling us Muslims that you have to speak to the people of the book. People of the book means people of the revelation. Indicating in this Quran specifically, when the word people of the book is used, it is referring to Yahud and Nasara, to the Jews and the Christians. So Allah is telling the Muslims to talk to the Ahle Kitab. Allah also says, Ya Ahle Kitab, O people of the book. So that means Quran is addressing not only to the Muslims, or to the Arabs, but to the Ahle Kitab also. Therefore, I mentioned that this last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was sent for the whole of humanity. If it was a human work, if it was a human work, as you say, then Almighty God will never mention that go and ask the Jews and Christians. It is mentioned in the scriptures. At that time, there were many who did not know about the Jews and Christians, what happened in the past. When they checked up, it turned out to be true. Further, it says, it talks even about prophecies, that what's going to happen in the future. So all these things, brother, it cannot be the work of a human being. For more details, you can refer to my talk, Is the Quran God's Word? Hope that answers the question. Uh, when, you know, I travel more than 55 countries, and Quran and Hadith, they prohibit the idol worship. But you go, you other religion, Christianity, uh, this one, uh, Buddhism, and Chinese religion, Jainism, all other religions, they have idol worship. And you know, Muslim, maybe they are 15 to 20 percent in this world, total, per percentage wise. And so, other people are wrong. You know, Christian, one minute, uh, any Anglican church or Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox or Catholic or Protestant, you know, Chinese, they have the big statue of the God. So, all, all they are wrong. Well, that's a very good question. He's saying the Muslims are approximately 15, 20%. Some say 25%. Whatever it is. You say 15%, 20%, I've got no problem. So he's telling that Christians, they do idol worship. Fine, I agree with you. He says that Buddhism create big statue. What do you think they're wrong? Brother, the majority doesn't win in Islam. In Islam, the truth prevails. The majority people, a couple of hundred years ago, said the world was flat. Majority. 
Do you know that? Majority of the people, few hundred years back, said the world is flat. Is the world flat, Brother Mahesh? No. Nah. Nah. So majority people can be wrong. In Islam, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقَّ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلْ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ قَانَ زَوْكَ Say that truth has arrived and falsehood perish. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Therefore, in Islam, majority never wins. If you go to America, in America, pornography is legalized. Do you believe in pornography? Uh, no, so many countries, no, no, European no, countries. No, no, no. Do you believe in pornography, Brother Mahesh? I don't believe. No, very good. Very good, you mean me. I congratulate you. But the majority of people in the Western world believe in pornography. So will you believe in pornography? Uh. Will you see pornography? <laughs> very good. Good boy. See, you are close to the truth. So majority never wins. As far as you say, in Christianity, idol worship is there. In Christianity, idol worship is not there. Christians do idol worship. Like some Muslims do wrong things. If you read the Christian Bible, which you have read the Christian Bible, I'm sure, it's mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7, 8 and 9, Thou shalt not have any graven image of me, Almighty God, He's telling, in the Old Testament, Thou shalt have no graven image of me, of anything, of any likeness, in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, and the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not serve them, now bow down to them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. Same message repeated in the book of Exodus. Chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5. That thou shalt have no graven image of me, of anything, of any likeness, in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. So according to the Old Testament, idol worship is prohibited. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 20, Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Whosoever shall break one of the least commandments and teach me to do so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall keep the commandments, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. That means if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, according to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, you have to follow each and every law of the Old Testament, of Moses, peace be upon him. No making images of Almighty God. Yet they make. Why? All the Christians don't make. The Protestants don't make. Your knowledge of Christians is a bit less. You are a student yet. The Catholics, they make. They make a statue. That's the reason the Protestants, they protest. What you're doing is wrong. So according to the Bible, you should not make images of Almighty God. I agree with you. Most of the Hindus, they do idol worship. And I quoted earlier, Na tat masti. Of that God, there is no pratima. There are no images. There are no sculptures. There are no statues. Brother, do you do idol worship? I am doing, no. Ah, but you're not following the Veda. Because I believe in all religion, all they I are believe same. all the religion. You know, God knows because you know God knows this. All religion. Brother, you know, if no. you are believing in no, all no, the religions, no. that thing. means irrespective whether you are following other religion or not, you are not following Hinduism. Brother, you are not no, following no, Hinduism. What I am telling you, God is sleeping now. He knows everything. He created all the earth and heaven. So he knows every religion have their own place, like Islam. Brother, let's ask one question at a time. There's a big queue there. I will answer your next question. After that, go behind the queue. You are most welcome to ask you. Fine. You are that is God sleeping. Allah gives this answer in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number two fifty-five. Allah says, "Allah la ilaha illa qayyum la taqoodinatam wa la naum." That Allah is eternal, absolute. He is self-subsisting. He does not require to sleep. No slumber can seize him. Nor does he require rest. You and I require to sleep. You and I require rest. God does not require to sleep. Allah clearly says in the Quran, if he wanted, he could have made each and every human being except Islam submit to the will. If he wanted, very easy. Just kun fa kun. But this is a test for the hereafter. God is testing you. God is testing me. If God wants, he can easily make you not do idol worship. But where is the test? The test is, God has given you the rules. Now, do you follow the rule or not? You say, you follow all the religion. You're not following Hinduism. You're not following Islam. You're not following Christianity. You're not following Sikhism. You're not following Buddhism. Buddhism, quote me any reference from Dhamma Pad, from any Buddhist scriptures where Buddha said, make a statue of me. He never said that. 
Where did he say that? Tomorrow, suppose, tomorrow, if any Muslim makes a statue of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, if he makes a statue and calls the Muslim, I say he's wrong. The Prophet never said I make a statue of him. So just because someone diverts and does the wrong thing, whether he's in minority or majority, that does not become the truth. Buddha never said make a statue of him. So if someone is against the Buddhist sculptures, they're helping the Buddhists follow the religion. So just because they made a big statue of Buddha, that does not mean they're following Buddha. Therefore, I said, if you want to understand religion, don't look at followers. Brother Mahesh, don't look at me. Look at the scripture. Look at the Quran. Read the Quran. Read the Veda. At least what is common, follow. What is not common, keep it aside. If you say you follow all the religion, you're not following Hinduism. You're not following Christianity. You're not following Islam. Leave aside all. I am requesting you at least follow what is common. What is not common, we can discuss later on. You are not even following what is common. Leave aside following all the religion. So the day you stop doing idol worship, then I can say at least you are following one major part of all the religion. The day you believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the last messenger, then I can say you are following the two major pillars in most of the major religions. Okay. Hope that answers the question. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Can we have the next question? Is there a brother, the non-Muslim? Yeah, good evening, doctor. My name is Jay Majid here. I've completed my engineering this year. And first of all, uh, this is my first time I've been visiting uh, your open talk. And uh, it was uh, really appreciable, the knowledge of all the scripts you have, and the confidence you have, and a lot of uh, Muslim supporters which uh, really follow you. Now, my question to you is a bit political. Now, I would like to ask you, doctor, uh, do you advise all the Muslims to follow the principles of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, uh, like example of non-violence Satyagraha, uh, which he fought for us to get an independence from Britishers, uh, as I believe and I respect all the holy books like uh, Quran, Gita, Bible, Apart from that, in today's world, I feel I am more an Indian. So, would you advise Muslims to follow principles of Mahatma Gandhi like non-violence, satyagraha, or any of the principles of Mahatma Gandhi? So, that is the question that do I suggest the Muslims to follow the principles of Mahatma Gandhi, then he change it to any principle of Mahatma Gandhi, that is non-violence and satyagraha. Whichever... Or, or, Sorry, sorry to interrupt, doctor. Or any of the principles of yeah, Mahatma I, Gandhi? I, I got a question. Starting, you said the principles, meaning all the principles. Then you said any principle, I'll give answer to both. All those principles of Mahatma Gandhi, which match with the Quran, which match with our Creator, match with the saying the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I've got no objection telling the Muslims, follow it wholesale. For example, the Satyagraha movement, of Mahatma Gandhi non-violence. The Prophet did the same. Not that he copied from Mahatma Gandhi. It is Mahatma Gandhi who copied from the Prophet, which I'll come to it later on. If you see the Makki age of the Prophet, the first approximate 13 years that he spent in Makkah, he told the followers, no violence. Many non-Muslims accepted Islam. They were fierce warriors. The Prophet said, your jihad is sabr. Sabr means patient. Many Muslims were killed and butchered. The pagan Makkin that time, they targeted the weak Muslims. They tortured them. They killed them. So those who were powerful, they got angry. They said that they killed our brothers. We will take revenge. The Prophet said, your jihad is sabr. See, someone who has the power to fight back. And he fights back, it's good. But someone who has the power to fight back, and the commandment is, don't fight back. And then he restrains himself. That is real jihad. Jihad in Arabic means to struggle. It means to strive. So here the Prophet's commandment was non-violence. They went on the streets only saying that we bear witness that there's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon the messenger of Allah. People stoned them, they did not retaliate. People abused them, they did not retaliate. The Prophet went to Tahif, people stoned him. He didn't retaliate. So this is one of the strategies 
but not the only strategy. So do you want me to complete the answer? No, so sir. After, after Dr. Zakir completes your question, we'll allow you to ask. You okay, have okay. to have some patience, brother. Okay, okay, sir. You have asked a question, I have to give the reply. So this part of Mahatma Gandhi of non-violence, depending on situation. But now if you tell the Indian government, you know the person is robbing, non-violence, don't arrest him. The person is raping, non-violence, don't arrest him. The Indian government will agree. Every country has a police force. This force is meant to let peace prevail in that country. So sometimes they use force against the criminal to let peace prevail. You can't tell the government, can't tell the police commissioner of Bombay that, see, Mahatma Gandhi said non-violence, so a person is robbing, let him rob, only do shiksha, but don't rob. Suppose they come and rape your sister, you'll say, okay, don't rape, don't rape, non-violence. So non-violence is the best. In Islam, there is something like zulm. Zulm, in Arabic, the best translation of zulm can be oppression. And a person who does oppression is called as a zalim, zalim person. And who is more zalim than a person who can stop the oppression and does not stop the oppression? The Prophet Muhammad said in the hadith of Sahih Muslim that if you see an evil, you stop it with your hand. If you cannot stop it with the hand, then stop it with the tongue. If you cannot stop it with the tongue, then curse in your heart. And if you curse in your heart, you are the lowest level of Mormon, you are the lowest level of Muslim. Suppose you see a rape taking place. Mahatma Gandhi said, oh, don't rape, don't rape. The best is if you have the power to stop, stop it with your hand. She may not be your sister. She may not be your mother. If you see someone raping, if you can stop it with your hand, you stop it with your hand. If you cannot, if you are weak, if you don't have the power, at least say, oh, bhai sahab, rape mat karo, baladkar mat karo. Dear brother, don't rape, at least with your tongue. If you think, if I say with my tongue also, he'll kill me, at least curse in your heart. So depending upon the situation, the strategy keeps on changing. When Prophet went to Medina, there he was peaceful. He did Suleh Hudaybiyah. He signed a contract between the pagan, the unbelievers and Muslim. They broke the contract. When they come for war, then the Almighty God said, when they come for war, don't get scared, fight. Kill them. So depending upon the situation, and according to the people, historians, Michael H. Hart, he wrote a book of the 100 most influential people in human history. Number one, he gave to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But I'm not mentioning him for that. Among the important misses was Mahatma Gandhi. Michael H. Hart, a famous historian, after mentioning the 100 most influential people in history, he mentioned the important misses. And in that, he mentioned Mahatma Gandhi. And he says, the Satyagra movement of Mahatma Gandhi, which was one of the important movements, which let the Britishers go back. But what he said, even if this movement wasn't there, yet India would have got independence, according to the famous historian, Michael H. Hart. So what we realize, that depending upon the situation, we have to use the strategy. You can't say always non-violence. Sometimes, violence will have to be used to let peace prevail. Like how you have police in every country, in every state. So anyone who goes beyond the limits, who rapes, who robs, who harms other people, that time, as a last resort, like the country says the police can use force, similarly Islam says, as a last resort, as a last alternative, sometimes force can be used to let peace prevail. Hope that answers the question. If I have any other question, you're most welcome, brother. No, sir, I'm convinced with it, and thanks for the That's answer. the reason I said, don't interrupt me. Alhamdulillah. It's my profession. I'm in the field. If I give the complete answer, people are convinced. I start the answer, people want to object. When you are putting your hand up, your mind is going on the question, you aren't paying attention on my answer. So when you listen with an open mind, inshallah, I will answer your question. If not, inshallah, I will give you a second opportunity. Okay, and I would also like to advise all the Muslim people over here. Uh, you have a great scholar like Dr. Naik. So please follow Muslims 100% uh, as uh, there are some doubts like people do not follow it 100%. 
so i hope all the muslims will uh, follow the muslim religion 100% and make uh, india proud thank you thank you very thank much you, brother, brother. I would request that all the Muslims should follow Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the last and final revelation the glorious Quran. As far as the brother, he said that Muslims should follow me 100%. I request him that even he should follow me. At least what I speak about the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. So, brother, we are waiting for an opportunity. I want you also to follow me. Me, as long as I match with the Quran and Sahih Hadith. If I don't match with Quran and Sahih Hadith, even Dr. Zakir Naik is zero. Zakir Naik has got no value. What I say, if it matches with the last and final commandment, the glorious Quran, and last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you follow me, I request you, even you should follow me, what I speak about the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Yes, sister. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. This is Bhageshri Savan. I'm a non-Muslim. I want to accept Islam in front of everybody because I want all these people to be on my shahada on the day of judgment. Ashadu anna illa illallah. Ashadu anna Muhammadu Rabbullah. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Mashallah, sister. I, I think Dr. Zakir can uh, pronounce it properly and I she can repeat. If I say it and you can pronounce it, you can say, Ashadu Allah ilaha. Ashadu anna ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa ashadu anna. Wa ashadu anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu wa Rasuluhu. Rasulullah. I bear witness. I bear witness. That there is no God but Allah. There is no God but Allah. And Prophet Muhammad. And Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Peace be upon him. Is the servant and messenger of Almighty God. Is the servant and messenger of Almighty God. Welcome to the religion of peace. Sister. Tadbir. Thank you. Tadbir. We find that in this 10 day conference that we have, the standard conference, there are many people who accepted Islam and many questions were asked to several of the speakers and they were convinced that this is the only solution for humanity and we appreciate that, sister. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you Jannah, peace in this world and the next world, inshallah. Any yes, questions, sister? sister you are most welcome to ask. Uh, this non-Muslim sister, she does not want to disclose her identity. Welcome. You, without disclosing her identity, she can ask a question. She is a student of MBA. She asks, why is Allah referred to Allah? Why not any other name? The sister has asked a question that why is Allah referred to as Allah and why not other names? The reply is given in the Quran in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, where it's mentioned in the Quran. Qulidullah abidur rahman ayyam atadu fala al asman husna. Say call upon him by Allah or call upon him by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belong the most beautiful names. You can call Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a pure name. It should be a correct name. It should be a name given by himself. And there are no less than 99 attributes given in the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Kareem, Al-Hakim, most merciful, most compassionate, most wise, no less than 99. And the crowning one is Allah. And this message that to Allah belongs the most beautiful names, besides Surah Isra chapter 17 verse number 110, it's also repeated in Surah Taha chapter number 20 verse number 8, and Surah Araf chapter number 7 verse number 180, and Surah Al-Hashar chapter 59 verse number 24 where Allah says that to Him belong the most beautiful names. But the crowning name is Allah. Now, why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God? The reason is, sister, all the other names and words, they can be played around with. For example, the English word God, if you add S to God, it becomes God's, plural of God. There's nothing like plural Allah. Kul hu Allahu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. If you add D-E-S-S to God, it becomes goddess, a female god. In Islam, there is nothing like male Allah or female Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no gender. If you add father to God, it becomes godfather. He's my godfather. He's my guardian. 
There's nothing like Allah, Abba, or Allah, Father in Islam. If you add a mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There's nothing like Allah, Mother, or Allah, Ammi in Islam. If you prefix tin before God, it becomes tin God, meaning a fake God. There's nothing like tin Allah in Islam. That's the reason we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah. And that's the reason this word Allah is also present in most of the major religious scriptures. If you read the six scriptures, one of the attributes given to Almighty God is Allah. If you read the Christian Bible, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 15, verse 34, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 27, verse number 46, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when he was put on the cross, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. O oh God, O oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? Does Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani sound like, O oh God, O oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? No. But if you translate into Arabic, it says, Allah, Allah, lama taraktani. Similar. So Hebrew and Arabic, they are sister languages. And if you read the Scofield Dictionary, it pronounces Allah also, Eli also is Allah, A-L-A-H. Same. So Allah is even mentioned in the Bible. Even in the Hindu scriptures, it's mentioned in the Vedas. There's a separate Upanishad by the name of Allah Upanishad. So this word Allah is also mentioned by name in the major world religious scriptures. This is the proper name of the true Almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. I Dr. Balavant Shastri. बिहार प्रवासी संघ के मैं राष्ट्रीय अध्यक्ष हूं और बम्बे में बहुत दिन से रह रहा हूं आज भी हाशमी आजमी साहब भी हम लोगों के पहचानते हैं कई बार मुलाकात करते हैं आपके अंतर राष्ट्रीय सम्मेलन में आने के सौभाग्य प्राप्त हुआ इसके लिए सभी भाइयों को मेरा तरफ से नमस्कार शुक्रिया मैं एक चीज बहुत उत्सुकता बस मैं कहना चाहता हूं कि हिंदू फिलॉसफी के अंदर में बसुधैव कुटुम बकम पूरा पृथ्वी मेरा कुटुम है परिवार है ऐसा हिंदू फिलॉसफी में कहा है और सर्वे भवंतु सुखी ना सर्वे संतु निरामया मतलब सब सुखी हो सब आनंदित रहे और सब अपने रोजी रोटी कमाते हुए खूब आनंद से रहे यह संदेश हमारे हिंदू फिलॉसफी में दिया है मेरे ख्याल से आपके फिलॉसफी में भी आपके दर्शन शास्त्र में भी इसी तरह के संदेश होगा और इस संदेश को आप लोगों ने समय समय से प्रचार भी किया है लेकिन एक आश्चर्य के साथ में और उत्सुकता बस मैं आपको इंगित करके कहना चाहता हूं कि या तो आप लोगों ने कुरान के सही माने को सही तरीका से विश्व लेवल में रखे नहीं या कुरान के संदेश को यदि आप रखे तो समझने वाला कितना समझा दूसरी बात यह है कि आज पूरे विश्व के अंदर में जितनी प्रतिष्ठा की नजर से कुरान और इस्लाम को जो पहले देखा जाता था कुछ वर्षों से उसमें कमी आई है जैसे कट्टरपंथी चरमपंथी आतंकवाद और कहीं ना कहीं तो मैं क्या समझूं या आपके प्रस्ताव रखने में गलती हुई है या कुरान के सही संदेश पहुंचाया नहीं गया या हम इस संदेश में पड़े हुए हैं कि जो इतना बड़ा कुरान जो भाईचारा के संदेश फैला रहा है चारों तरफ शांति का पैगाम देना चाहता है वह आज विश्व लेवल में और उसकी छवि क्या है धन्यवाद वेरी गुड इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन हिंदू फिलोसफी वी बिलीव दैट द फुल वर्ल्ड द होल ह्यूमैनिटी इज लाइक अ फैमिली एंड एवरी वन शुड लिव हैपीली इन दैमिली अर्न मनी लिव हैपीली एंजॉय लाइफ That was his question. Is it similar in Islam? And he says, surely in Islam it will be somewhat similar. And then he comes to his question and asks that this Quran 
it should reach the full world. Is there a mistake in the Muslims explaining the Quran? Or is there a mistake in the people understanding it? That today we find Muslims are being labeled as terrorists, as fundamentalists, as extremists. So what is the real problem? As far as the first question, I do agree with him that Hinduism does say that the whole world is a family. We should live happily, earn, enjoy. Islam says somewhat similar except for the ending. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuhu annaasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa jalnaakum shuhubam wa qaba ila li ta'arafu inna kramakum inda la yatkakum inna la alimun khabeer O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you may recognize each other not that you may despise each other so the Quran says that all the humankind has got one common grand, 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 great, 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 grand, grand, grandparents, Adam and Eve. May Allah be pleased with them both. And Allah has divided us into nations and tribes, different colors, different languages, so that you may recognize each other. And the criteria for judgment in the sight of Almighty God, it's not wealth, it's not caste, it's not color, it's not sex, but it is taqwa. And God Almighty said, most honored, in the same verse of Surah Ujra, chapter 49, verse 13, Allah continues and says, and the most honored amongst you is the person who has taqwa. In Hinduism, he said that we have to lead a life happily, earn. In Islam, we have to lead your life happily, yes, but on the basis of taqwa. The only criteria in which makes you superior, it is taqwa, it is righteousness, it is God consciousness. It's not money, it's not wealth, it's not sex, it's not caste. Now coming to his question that, the Quran is such a good book. Is it that there's problem in communication regarding the preachings of Quran, or are we not able to understand? That's the reason, brother, we're having this talk. Islam, the solution for humanity. The problem is in media portraying Islam. And we Muslims, it's our fault. I do agree with you. We aren't expert in media. We Muslims are to blame. As it is the duty of every Muslim to convey the message of Islam, to convey the message of the Quran to the whole of humanity. We aren't doing a full job. We are trying. We are trying a level best. Today, the best way you can reach the masses, now, see the gathering, surely hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many, but yet, for us, it is retail. 100,000 is retail for me. We believe in millions. Therefore, we are showing live on the satellite channel. And there's estimated viewership of more than 60 million people watching. 60 million. The 100,000, 200,000 is peanuts. I can give shahada to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have delivered the message to humankind. And 60 million is at least 1%. Yet there's nothing. 1% of humankind, if you count it to be 6 billion. What we want, that we Muslims should be more forward in media. There should be more channels. It should spread much more. And I do agree with you, there is a problem in understanding. That's the reason, as you mentioned, that we are being labeled as extremists, as fundamentalists, as terrorists. And my talk was based on that, that how should you reply when a person says that you are a fundamentalist, you are a terrorist, you are extremist. So hopefully, inshallah, you'll get the translation after this lecture. Hopefully. Hope that answers the question, brother. Yes. Is there a brother, non-Muslim there? Yes, brother. Uh, sir, my name is Gil Roy from Bombay. I'm a businessman. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I really enjoyed today, my first time. And my question is about conversions into and out of uh, Islam. Now, many Muslim countries do not permit conversion out of Islam. Some even use the sword and they have death penalty. But correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know of any non-Muslim majority country which prohibits people from converting into Islam. Now, what, what is the right thing in Islam? Because as you say, you know, you don't need the sword for Islam and uh, thousands and millions of followers will anyway get into Islam, then why, if someone wants to convert out those countries, are they right? I mean, why can't they allow people 
and see for themselves if someone wants to convert out of Islam. For example, if America today, which is largely Christian, more than uh, majority Christian, if they would prohibit conversions, how, say conversions into Islam, then what would be your response? The brother asked a very good question and a very important question. This question has got two parts. The first part is that why don't some of the Muslim countries allow conversion or allow propagation? They don't allow the propagation to take place. They don't allow conversion from anyone to convert Muslim to a non-Muslim. Basic question, whether it be anyone. And secondly, what about the death penalty for conversion? What if America today does not allow propagation, does not allow conversion? What will be your state? Very good question. Brother, as far as the propagation is concerned, there are countries, for example, Saudi Arabia, which does not allow propagation, the only country which I know very well, which does not allow propagation, it is Saudi Arabia. And the reason is that suppose, brother, you want to start a school. If you want to start a school, you are taking an interview of a match teacher. So when you take the interview of the match teacher, you ask the question, 2 plus 2 is equal to how much? So one match teacher says, 2 plus 2 is equal to 3. The second match teacher says, 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. The third match teacher says, 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. Now many people say, what's the problem? Let them preach any religion. Whoever wants to accept, let them accept. I will ask you a question. Will you allow a match teacher in your school to teach 2 plus 2 is equal to 3? Will you select the match teacher who says 2 plus 2 is equal to 5? You say, no, I know maths. I'm definite about it. In maths, 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 and nothing else. So as far as religion is concerned, Saudi Arabia is very confirmed. It agrees with the verse of the Quran in Surah Imran. Chapter 3, verse number 19. In the in the Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is peace acquired by submitting evil to Almighty God. They will not allow anyone else to preach anything wrong. But in science and technology, they say to the Americans, Helen was Helen. You're most welcome. They get people from England, they get people from India. No problem. In science and technology, they're not number one. So in science and technology, they have people coming from America, from England, from Singapore, from Philippines, from India, from all over the world. But as far as Dean is concerned, they are cocksure. They're 100% sure this is right. Same as you are cocksure that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, you will not allow any wrong teachings. Same way, I agree with that. I'm a student of comparative religion, brother. There's no religious scripture on the face of the earth besides the Quran, which says that this is the only true religion. You read the scriptures of the Hindus. You read the scripture of the Christian, the Bible. Nowhere does the Bible say that Christianity is right. The word Christianity doesn't exist in the Bible. Do you know that? The word Christianity doesn't exist in the Bible. The word Hindu doesn't exist in the Vedas. Do you know that? Nowhere does the Veda say that this is the only right religion. Nowhere does the Bible say that this is the only right religion. So Quran is the only religious scripture on the face of the earth where Almighty God says emphatically, in Nadina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is Islam. So as far as preaching, propagating, and religion is concerned, I'm sure that if you know what is confirmed, they will not allow anyone else to preach something which is wrong. This India, it's a secular country. It's not a Hindu country. It's in the constitution of the people, for the people, by the people. I'm an Indian. Geographically, I'm a Hindu because I'm an Indian, but practicing Muslim. I'm a practicing Muslim. It's my birthright in this country to preach, propagate, and practice this religion. That is what is in the constitution. So you have to change your constitution. What we realize that America is a democratic country. It's mentioned in the constitution about freedom of speech. So what we realize, brother, that if you say that what if they don't allow propagation? What if they don't? How will I feel? It is not mentioned in the Christian scriptures. So I will say they're not following their Christianity. They're not following the Bible. Even if you agree this is a Hindu country, which is not. It's a secular country. No way it is mentioned. You being a Christian, I wanted to point out one statement from the Bible which says that Christianity is the only right religion. Yes, brother. Uh, sir.
you know, it is about interpretation of the Bible, the Old and the New Testament. It is not difficult for theologians to find an interpretation which says, if a Christian converts out of Christianity, he should be put to death, as it was in Spain during the Inquisition. But that was 500 years ago. And today, because of human values, I don't know of any Christian majority country which puts or prohibits, I'm not talking of propagation, I'm not talking of preaching, I'm talking of an individual. Suppose an individual in some Muslim country, brother, say Pakistan, brother, say Pakistan. Bro brother, that if, was, brother, that was the second part of the question. That's the reason, let me complete my answer. You keep on... Didn't I say in the starting, I repeated a question for the benefit of the audience. The brother has got two parts. The first part I covered and your hand is going up. Now, when your hand is going up, I'm a medical doctor. Your mind is not paying attention to answer. Correct? We give you a opportunity to ask the question. Give me a opportunity to answer. Yes, brother? Okay. Didn't I say you had two parts of the question? So before my answer is over, and if I keep on talking, everyone else will understand, you don't understand. I want even you to understand. I want even you to accept the religion of peace. Correct, brother? Coming to the second part of the question. What if someone wants to accept, wants to come out of Islam? Quran clearly mentions in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 256, like Rafidin, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. So as per se, if someone wants to convert from Islam to any other religion, fine. In the year after, he'll be among the losers. As far as the death penalty is concerned, that only if that person, after converting, if he propagates his new faith and speaks against Islam, then the penalty of death is there. And this is the same law, somewhat similar law in most countries, including India. There's something like apostasy in India. In India, if suppose someone sells the secrets of the country to an enemy, fine. What he's selling may be the truth. He may have blueprints. Some countries will give death penalty, some countries will give life imprisonment, even though he's speaking the truth. So every country has its law. So in Islam, if someone changes from a Muslim after accepting, to any other religion and propagates it and preaches it and speaks against it only if it's an Islamic country. If someone does that in India, no one can kill him here. If he's in a country which follows the Islamic law, now what he's doing? He's causing corruption. He's spreading things which are unpeaceful. So for this, if it's an Islamic country, all the so-called Muslim countries don't follow Islamic law. I would like to tell you. You can go on the fingertips. There are also some people follow this law, some countries follow the other law. I don't know any country in the world which is 100% Islamic. I don't know any. I don't know any. So what we have to realize, brother, that if it's an Islamic country following the Islamic law, and if that country, such a situation takes place, like in India, if someone sells the secret of the country, he'll be put in prison for how many years, I don't know, or maybe put to death, like in America, the same thing. Similarly, this is the law of the country. The country is based on the law of the religion. So based on that, I hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you, brother. Can we have the next question from the sister side? Assalamu alaikum, Jakhir bhai. My name is Neelam Shirke. I am a Hindu family. I have been taught in the Azad Maidan the similarity of Hindu and Muslim. और उस दिन से मैं इस्लाम पसंद करती हूँ। आज सबके सामने मैं इस्लाम कबूल कर रही हूँ। लाइला इलाला मोमदुर रसूलुल्लाह अम्मेन। माशाल्लाह कंग्रेडिटेड सिस्टर जस्ट फॉर द बेनिफिट ऑफ दोस्त डू नॉट अंडरस्टैंड हिंदी द सिस्टर सेड दैट शी हैड हर्ड मैन लेक्चर द फर्स्ट टाइम अ फ्यू इयर्स बैक इन आजाद मैदान � similarities between Islam and Hinduism. And since that day, she has been appreciating Islam. And today, she has accepted Islam as a lifestyle. And we welcome you to the religion of peace. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah accept. And inshallah, you get Jannah, get the best of this world and the Akhirah. Thank you, sister. Any question? Yeah. Uh, I was Sandhya. Now I'm Zara Bilal Khan. I converted to Islam. I want to check one thing that you were saying, like there is no murti and something like that. 
but there is one place in Kerala, it is like uh, there is one statue which is coming from the uh, rock and it is growing. Then why is it so? Mr. Das, the question is nothing like Murti I said, but she knows of a place in Kerala in which there is a statue in the mountain or the rock, she's saying, it is growing. How it is growing? The question. That means there's something in the statue. Sister, do you know even mountains grow? Do you know that? Yeah. Yeah, so if you know, that's how the statue can grow. That does not mean, that does not mean it has got life in it. No, it's coming from, uh, like, inside the rock. There is nothing statue on the rock. It is coming from inside the rock. So that's from telling you, sister. It's coming from inside the rock. Even the mountain can grow, sister. How does it grow? You know, in geology we study. That it can keep on growing. And there are many such examples. For example, we know that a few years back, there was a Ganesh statue which was drinking milk. It's a simple scientific phenomenon of osmosis. It's a simple phenomenon of osmosis that if you have a jug with a sprout and you put on the milk, it will automatically rise. It's osmosis. That doesn't mean that the statue is drinking milk. And that's how the many TV channels are exposed. So what we have to realize, sister, that these are inanimate objects. As the Veda clearly mentions, in the Ajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima, there is no image, there is no statue, there is no sculpture, there is no photograph. Hope that answers the question, sister. But one thing, uh, then how is the shape coming from the inside? There is one shape which is coming outside. Sister, you know shape? As far as shape is concerned, a human being can give shape by chiseling. Automatically, naturally it can come, there is no problem. There are so many statements mentioning that there are trees which are mentioning Om or some trees mentioning La 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 La. See, all these things don't carry weight at all. We are talking about truth, sister. And there are many mountains which look like human faces. Haven't you seen? So, it is by nature, if it resembles something, that doesn't mean it's a miracle. You have to follow the Hindu scriptures and the Quran and the Bible which say Almighty God has got no images. The stone can look like a man can look like an image, can look like a statue. That doesn't mean it is God's sister. Thank you. And many of these stones and images and idols, if it falls, it breaks. When it cannot help itself, how will it help you and me, sister? Hope that answers Definitely. the question. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Yes, brother, the next question. Good evening, sir. My name is Subhash Kamre. I'm a lecturer from chemistry department, Thana College. In the beginning of your lecture, you said that Quran talks about uh, giving peace to humanity. I, my question is that, if it is talking about peace, then why so many young men from various countries are falling to the prey of terrorism in the name of jihad? What is the concept of jihad? Thank you, sir. The brother asked a good question, that if Islam and Quran speak about peace to humanity, then how come there are so many young Muslims and other Muslims from different countries who are fighting and who are talking about jihad. What is the concept of jihad? As far as the word jihad is concerned, jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive. It means to struggle. So jihad basically means to strive against struggle. Jihad does not mean holy war. Holy war, if you translate into Arabic, means harbu muqaddasa. There is no Arabic word harbu muqaddasa in the Quran or any of the Sahih Hadith. This is a mistranslation by the media and the Orientalists. There is no holy war. Jihad does not mean holy war. Jihad means to strive to struggle. Furthermore, in Islamic context, it means to strive and struggle to improve the humanity. It means to strive and struggle to bring peace in humanity. It also means to strive and struggle in the battlefield in self-defense. It also means to strive and struggle against oppression. Jihad basically means to strive and struggle. Now, coming to your question, that how come then so many youngsters from different countries, they are fighting? Point number one, there are possibilities, and it's a fact, that some of the Muslims, they are being misled by the anti-social element. That fight, it's there in Islam, etc., misquoting out of context, but this is a small percentage. The major reason, according to me, is how the media portrays. Like in India, 
we very often read in the newspaper that the Muslim terrorist in Kashmir killing so many people. Headline. Regularly you read. I was called to Kashmir the first time in 2003. And I was thinking, should I go or not? Should I go or not? So much of chaos. First time in Kashmir, the government gave permission after 14 years to hold a public lecture. And the gathering was somewhat big, 100,000 people. In polo grounds in the city of Srinagar. And when I went there, there were guards, you know, with guns and all around me. And I was expecting, but there wasn't much problem. Next day, I went to Assam. I landed on the airport. There were four guards with guns, machine guns. What is this? There is killing in Assam. Killing in Assam? Where it takes place? And there, if I did not have the guards, I wouldn't be here to give the talk. But in the paper, where do we hear about the killing going on in Assam? There are more people being killed in Assam than in Kashmir. Who hears about the LTT? You know the LTT? The Tamilians, they are called as Tamil Tigers. They are not called as Hindu terrorists. Why? If Kashmiri Muslims do it, they are called as Muslim terrorists. If the Hindus in Assam do it, it's a local problem. If the LTT does it, local problem. In India, you ask anyone who has the knowledge of law and order, he will tell you the maximum killing is done by the Maoist. How many times do we read in the newspaper? If we read in the newspaper, in news brief. Okay, so many people killed in Assam. News brief. Muslims do it, headlines. Why? There are black sheep in every community. Then one person came and told me, you know, you should understand, this is a problem of land. Assam is not a problem of land. It is the Kashmir which is a problem of land. Both the countries are fighting and the poor Kashmiris are being, they are being harassed. Neither here, neither there. If you go to Afghanistan, that's the problem of land. The Americans have come there, and you call them terrorists. See what's happening in Palestine. The Jews, see the Jews were kicked out by Hitler, kicked out from Germany. The Palestinians, the Arab cousins, they said, Alan was Alan. You are most welcome in a house. Now imagine, suppose a traveler is homeless, without a roof, you allow him to come to your house. After a few days, he kicks you out, and at the doorstep, you're saying, he has taken my house, give my house back. They call you a terrorist. What terrorist? So you realize this is the media. It is media. What we realize, what's happening in Bosnia? The Muslims, correct. I do agree with you. The Muslims are coming in the picture, but they are being harassed. Where is humanity? What have we done for the people of Palestine? For the people of Iraq, weapons of mass destruction. I'm not in favor of Saddam Hussein. I don't consider him a good Muslim. But there were problems when Saddam was ruling. After the Americans came, the problems were multiplied. Correct? So what are you talking about weapons of mass destruction? Just because George Bush says, go and attack and you're attacking, the person that has killed maximum number of human beings, it is George Bush. So number one terrorist is George Bush. So what we realize, brother, it is the media. The Muslims are being harassed, they are the sufferers, and you call them terrorists. So that's the reason, but there are black sheep in the community also. But the black sheep are a minority. It's a minority. The major thing is the media. You know IRA, Irish Republican Army in UK. It is a fight between the Catholics and the Protestants. No one calls them as Catholic terrorists. Why? More than 100 years. But Tony Blair and the new prime minister are more worried about Muslim terrorists. They aren't worried about the IRA which has killed hundreds of people. How many bomb blasts have they done? They are more having secret meetings about how to stop, how to stop Muslim terrorists. And it's very common. Any politician, he wants the vote bank. The new prime minister came, then there was Jasko bombing. You know Sabil Ahmed? Have you heard Sabil Ahmed? Very good. I have heard him, I haven't seen him. It came in the Indian papers. You know Sabil Ahmed? Sabil Ahmed was a fan of Dr. Zakir Naik. And he organized Dr. Zakir Naik's lecture in Bangalore in the full article on terrorism. Then they talk about Sabil Ahmed. Then they talk about Dr. Zakir Naik. Why? Because Dr. Zakir Naik is popular. Article will carry more weight. Then they continue saying that Dr. Zakir Naik, however, is vehemently against terrorism. They include my name in the article. You know the 
the issue of Lal Masjid in Pakistan. CDs were found of Dr. Zakir Naik. So you should be happy. When the Indian press is saying Dr. Zakir Naik is against terrorism, you should be happy that Sabil Ahmed has made DVDs. You should be happy that Lal Masjid has made DVDs. If I'm against terrorism, so you should realize that maybe there were tens of thousands of Muslims who had done terrorist act because they are my fans, they have stopped doing terrorism. Because if a person is sick, he has to go to a doctor. Correct? So you can't say that sick people are going to the hospital. A sick person should go to the hospital. So if you assume that these are terrorist organizations and they're hearing my lectures, the Indian government should be happy. When Dr. Zakir Naik speaks against terrorism, they should be happy that these people are listening to me. I may not be able to convince everyone, but at least quite a few I'm convincing. But in the article, they write my name for weightage. You know, so it's become, if you write against Islam, the chances the article will be selected very easy. And that's common. Same as Kushman Singh. You know Kushman Singh? Now his age is 94. Year before last, he wrote an article against me. Couple of weeks back in November, he wrote an article against me. He says, in the first article he mentioned, that I watch Dr. Zakir Naik's program religiously every day. He writes. He praises me, talks about my memory, and then criticizes me in his style. Again, he wrote an article that in Delhi, there was a book exhibition, and the hot seller was Dr. Zakir Naik's book on answers to the 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims. Oh, that person has fantastic memory, blah, 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 but I will reply to four of his questions. And he replies to pork, to alcohol, to polygamy, as well as parda, hijab. And you read the article. Time will not permit me to speak about everything. In pork, I say that it is the most shameless animal, more than 70 diseases. It is the only animal that invites its friends to have sex with the mate. So I said, if you eat pig, you behave like pig. It is the only animal that invites it's friends to have sex with the mate. He said, I did not know that. And he says that, I don't know the Western countries, they're having pig, and I don't see any epidemic or any disease. See, doctors tell us today that don't go to a prostitute, you'll have AIDS. But everyone that goes to prostitute does not get AIDS. The percentage is small. The minority of the people get. Similarly, everyone that has spoke doesn't get these diseases. But today, more than 50% of the Americans, they are suffering from hypertension. And one of the causes is because of pig eating. He talks about alcoholism. Dr. Zakir Naik says, because of alcohol, you have so many diseases. So he says, Quran is not against alcohol, it's against getting intoxicated. Now he's trying to interpret the Quran. This is the media. And he says, I am of the age of 94 years old. I am drinking every day in my life. I have never got intoxicated. I have never got sick. And I have never hurt any individual. Now all these three things, age of 94, has never got intoxicated. I know so many common friends who tell me that they have seen him intoxicated so many times. Never seen a doctor. Maybe he forgot, age of 94. He has never hurt anyone. He has hurt me. So what we realize that when you write articles against Islam, against people who are famous, you get good readership, you get good viewership. So similarly, you realize that today that the image that we have of Muslims are terrorists, some may be fighting for the freedom of the country. Imagine if I tell you that the British government said Bhagat Singh was a terrorist. Was Bhagat Singh a terrorist? Was he or not? Yes, sir. Was Bhagat Singh a terrorist or not? His act was like terrorist. But was he a terrorist according to no. you? According to me also, he was not a terrorist. But just because the British government says that Bhagat Singh is a terrorist, that doesn't mean I have to agree with the British government. What we have to realize, this is major, the ploy of the media. That's the reason this talk was based on that, so that we can spread peace. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, sir. Yes, brother. Pranam Guru. My name is Advait Vilas Kakade. I am from Nayar Hospital. I am a medical student. My question is, we are actually very fortunate to get this human form of life. This is very, very rare, which comes from millions and millions uh, years. So, in what respect we should utilize that human form of life? Or what is the 
most sublime aim in our life or what is the real goal of human form of life? The brother said that he is a medical student from Nair Hospital. I have to mention that even I passed from Nair Hospital, same hospital. I passed from the same medical college, Nair Hospital. I passed in 1991, approximately 16 years back. The brother asked the question that we get this human life. How should we utilize this human life? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Dariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 56. That we have created the men and the jinn not but to worship him. Worship him means obeying him. So the best we can do with this human life is to obey the commandments of Almighty God and let peace prevail in this world and the hereafter. The creator of the human beings, he will be the best person to give this answer. It's mentioned in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed? This life that we have, brother, is a test for the hereafter. We are undergoing a test. And if we follow the commandments of our Creator and lead life according to what He has said and let peace prevail by submitting our will to the Creator, we'll be successful in this world as well as the hereafter. Hope that answers the question. Yes, but uh, what we shouldn't, we young students, what should you do for that? Ah, what you should do? Brother should read the Quran. Read okay, the Quran and implement on the guidance of the Quran. If you read the Veda, the Veda speaks about one God, no idol worship. The Veda says there is a Rishi to come, there is a Kalkiya Uttar to come. He will show you good things. That Kalkiya Uttar is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This Quran is the last and final revelation of Almighty God to the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Read this message, accept it so that there is peace in this world as well as in Akhira. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sister. Uh, myself, Arti, I'm a non-Muslim. I'd like to ask a question that, uh, first of all, very thanks for uh, your, and giving me this opportunity to listen to you and understand Mus Islam. Uh, what I understood from your talk is mainly that it's a, religion which believes in peace and harmony and uh, scientific and rational beliefs. If it is so, then how does it believe in the whole idea of God and how does it believe the whole idea of heaven or the hell, if it's so rational? Sister has a question that she's heard the lecture, she's very happy to know Islam is a religion of peace, and it's a scientific religion, it's a rational religion. You're asking that if Islam is a rational religion, then how come it believes in God? It believes in heaven and hell? Sister, the only way you can believe in God is through science. Today, if I have to prove to an atheist, the only way I can prove is through the Quran, with the help of science. The best tool I've got today, previously it was miracles, then came the age of literature and poetry, every age, Quran is a miracle of miracles. It's a miracle of all times. So because of this, if you heard my talk, I've proved that because a person who believes in science, if he's rational, he will have to agree that Quran is the word of God. If he does not believe in science, if he's not rational, if he's not understanding, there's high chances he will not believe in the Quran. That's the reason I said today, science is not eliminating God, it is eliminating models of God. As far as science is concerned, the concept of God, most of the scientists, they believe in the existence of God today. Previously, according to Francis Bacon, it says that little knowledge of science makes you an atheist, but in-depth knowledge of science makes you a believer in God. Now coming to your second question about heaven and hell. Now if you analyze the Quran, whatever the Quran speaks about science, approximately you can say that 80% what the Quran speaks about science has been proved to be 100% correct about the creation of the universe, about the shape of the earth, light of the moon, that the sun rotates and revolves, water cycles, geology, botany, etc. 80% of what the Quran speaks about science is 100% proved to be correct. The remaining 20%, it goes in the ambiguous slot, neither right, neither wrong. So my logic says, when 80% is 100% correct, 
and the remaining 20% is neither right nor wrong. Not even 0.1% of the 20% have been proved to be wrong. My logic says that inshallah, God willing, even the 20% will be right. So heaven and hell, angels, jinn, science hasn't advanced that far. Today science has advanced maybe to understand 80% of the Quranic verses we speak about science. Tomorrow, maybe 50 years later, 100 years later, 200 years later, science will talk about heaven, will talk about hell, will talk about jinn. So my logic says, it's not an illogical belief. It's a logical belief when 80% is 100% correct and the remaining 20%, not even 0.1% is wrong. No scientist today can say that he can prove scientifically there is no hell. No scientist today can prove scientifically there is no heaven. He can say, I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it is not. It is ambiguous. So my logic says when 20% is ambiguous, neither right, neither wrong, when 80% 100% correct, I being a scientific person, I being a rational person, I say that inshallah, God willing, even that 20% will be correct. That's the reason I believe in hell, I believe in heaven, and I also believe in the angels and the jinn. Hope that answers the question. Um, I, I still have some clarification. I need some clarification. Anything connected with the same question? Yes, yeah. Actually, you said that science also follows or believes in God, or also Islam do that. Then what is the exact explanation that is that it has given? For God or for he heaven or hell? Sister, did you hear my full talk? Yeah. Did you hear my talk which I gave earlier last week? Is the Quran God's word? No, sir. Fine. This is my first talk. So in this talk, I spent 15 minutes trying to repeat in a nutshell what I spoke in two hours. What I request you, you take my video cassette recording, is the Quran God's word, and I've proved there that Quran is God's word, and also proved to an atheist the existence of Almighty God, which I did today in a nutshell, but in a fast way. So, I've proved that God has to exist. If God did not exist, who wrote this Quran? Who wrote this Quran 1400 years ago? Talking about... My question is also, then who wrote this Quran? Who wrote it? The Creator wrote it. God wrote it. What no human being can write. Sorry? What is the explanation for that? The explanation is my talk of two hours, sister. You can take the video cassette, and the similar talk I'd given in Bombay in 1995. And I would request some of the volunteers, the lady volunteer, to give you a copy of my talk, which I said in 1995 in Billa Matushri. Take that talk. Inshallah, it will give you more details about the explanation of God, as well as the existence of God, and Quran is the word of God. Hope that answers the question. Sister, you can collect the book also, Quran and Modern Science, on the way out, as well as, is the Quran God's word? These should satisfy most of your answers on that topic. Yes, brother. Thank you, sir. Sir, I am Dr. Rajesh, I am a homeopathic doctor and uh, I have uh, two questions that uh, I have read that about uh, Muhammad Paigambar as the last and the final prophet. Why the stress is given on the word last and the final? And are you afraid of any new one and if God decides and will send a new one, don't you welcome him? And if I want to do that, what is the solution of Thank you, sir. Brother, there are two questions. One thing that, why do you stress so much that he's the last prophet? If God wants to send a second one, can't he send? And the last question is, if I want to see Almighty God, what is the solution? I'll come to the last question later yes, on. Sir, the right. first question, why do I stress that Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet? Not only I stress, the Veda stress, the Purana stress, the Bible stress, as well as the Quran and the other scriptures. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 40. Ma kana Muhammadun aba adim mirjalikum wa laki Rasulullah wa khataman nabiyin wa kana Allahu bi kulleshin alima. That Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the father of any of you men. But he is the Prophet of Almighty God. He is the seal of the Prophet. And Allah is all-knowing, full of knowledge. Now when Almighty God said, if Almighty God wants to send, he can surely send. But Almighty God does not speak a lie. Almighty God doesn't tell a lie. It's mentioned in the Quran in chapter 33, Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse 40, that this is the last prophet, so Almighty God knows. If he wanted to send another prophet, he would not have mentioned this is the last prophet. So because he had mentioned the last prophet, I believe in it. And since Almighty God, he knows the future. You and I don't know the future. Almighty God knows the future, and he said that this is the last. Therefore, I believe in it. Now, 
depending upon the requirement, what was required, he has given. Some people say, why didn't he send Prophet Muhammad in the day one? You know, my son wants to do medicine. He said, why don't you put me in medical college directly? First, you have to go to school. Standard one, standard two, standard three, pass school, then medical, right? So depending upon how the humanity progressed, Almighty God kept on sending messengers. And by name, Torah mentioned, but there were many revelations sent. Torah, Zabur, Injil by name is mentioned. Now, Almighty God thought it fit that 1400 years back, humanity reached a level to understand the Quran. Then he sent his last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, last and final message, the glorious Quran. Now, if Almighty God wants, he can surely send. But since he has mentioned, he will not send, he will not send. And this religion has completed. The previous scriptures were not in the complete form. Allah mentions, Almighty God mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 3, that on this day have I completed my favor unto you, have chosen for you Islam, and complete the religion for you. After the religion of Islam is completed, nothing new can be added, nothing can be subtracted from this religion. It's complete. That's the reason if anyone today says that he gets revelation from Almighty God, anyone who says he's a prophet of God, he has to go to a psychiatrist. Today, there are hundreds of people claiming to be God, people claiming to be prophets of God. They require a psychiatrist. Because after this, no other revelation will come. After this, no other prophet will come. Regarding the second part of the question, what can you do if you want to see God? Anyone, if you tell what, what should I do? I'll tell you what should I do. In this world, you cannot see God. That was Moses, peace be upon him, it's mentioned in the Quran. He wanted to see God. So Almighty God said, look at the mountain. I will show a glimpse of me to the mountain. So what happened to the mountain? By looking what happened to the mountain, Prophet Moses fainted. So in this world you cannot see, but you can see in the next world. If you go to Jannah, you will have everything, food, everything you will have. The people, it mentioned Hadith, they will crave to see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you want to see Almighty God, you have to read the final revelation of God, the glorious Quran, and follow the final revelation, and follow the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you follow the scripture, and the last and final revelation, inshallah, you'll go to Jannah. If I follow, I will go to Jannah. And then inshallah, if we both are the same name, both of us will go to Jannah, and inshallah, we will see Almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, sir. Yes, brother. My name is Kishor. I am from Manipur, from North Orsi, from India. As you have told me that you are telling me that you are telling me the name of the jihad. In Manipur, there are many people who live in Manipur. As you are telling me that 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 उनसे डर के मारे मैं यहाँ पे बॉम्बे में आया हूँ और मणिपुर में आज तक आप लोग का ये पीस चैनल नहीं देखा और मैं बहुत अच्छा रिलीजन केचर हूँ मेरे नॉलेज बहुत अच्छी है मैं गुरुद्वारा गया हुआ हूँ चर्च गया हूँ इबल पड़ी हुई है सब जगह गया हूँ लेकिन आज तक मुझे ये नहीं मालूम चला कि मुसलमान ही लोग जो डाढ़ी रखते हैं और इस्लाम में क्या लिखा हुआ वो हिंदी में आज तक नहीं मिली ना इंग्लिस में मिली मुझे मणिपुर में और मैं ये चाहता हूँ कि अगर मणिपुर में या फिर कहीं पे भी नॉर्थ ईस्ट जोन में अगर आप लोग ये भेजें तो बहुत अच्छा रहेगा और मुझे एक इंग्लिश या फिर हिंदी में अगर यहाँ पे मिले तो मैं ये खरीदने के लिए तैयार हूँ ब्रदर आज द क्वेश्चन दैट लाइक पीपल आर फाइटिंग इन कश्मीर एंड दैट डूइंग जिहाद सिमिलर इन मणिपुर द पीपल आर फाइटिंग एंड ही हैड टू लीव द सिटी एंड कम हेयर एंड बिकॉज ऑफ द टेररिस्ट ही फिफ्टीन डेज हेयर ही हैपी टू लर्न अबाउट इस्लाम he wants to know that why is in peace channel in Manipur? Yeah. And he wants to know that why do Muslims keep a beard? These are two basic questions. Brother in Kashmir, as I mentioned, I can't say everyone is doing jihad. They are struggling, they are striving. Wait, 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 sir. You are thinking me as a wrong. I say you, you are at the right. I perfectly understood your question, brother. Okay. I never said that you are wrong. And your question is also very good, brother. But I'm trying to clarify that everyone fighting in Kashmir they may not be doing the true jihad. Some people for the ulterior motive may be doing wrong thing. 
those who are truly following the commandment of the Quran and fighting, then you can say that they are doing jihad fi sabilillah. I cannot put a blanket rule that everyone in Kashmir is doing jihad, jihad fi sabilillah. Now coming to your question of Manipur. I know that there is a lot of fighting going in Manipur and because of them you are here. Maybe it is Allah's planning. Almighty God has planned that because of fighting you are here, leave us at peace in this world, maybe you'll get peace in the year after also, correct? Now you have heard such a good lecture about peace. This world, peace is a temporary peace where you should strive. But the best peace is the peace in the year after. Now coming to your question, why do Muslims keep a beard and why peace channel is not seen in Manipur? As far as the peace channel is not seen in Manipur, you can easily take the frequency. If you put a dish, maybe the cable operators may not be putting it, but if you put a dish which costs just a few thousand rupees and face it in the direction of 68 degrees east towards Intelsat 10, inshallah you'll get the peace channel. You can try and tell the cable operator to see it. We cannot go to Manipur and try and force them. But if they put the dish and face it to 68 degrees east and tune into the frequency, inshallah I'll get it. Coming to your question, why do Muslims keep a beard? What I say, that if the label shows your intent to wear it, I'd give them the talk, that if the label shows your intent to wear it, for example, if you go to a conference, of intellectuals, the people wear a label. I'm a doctor, I'm an engineer, I'm a scientist. It gives an informal introduction. When you go to a gathering, a conference, only of doctors, then the speciality is mentioned. There's Dr. So-and-so, he's a cardiologist, neurologist, nephrologist. If you have a heart problem, you go to a cardiologist. If you want to know about kidney, then you go to a nephrologist. If you have a brain problem, neurologist. Informal introduction. The Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 54. The Quran says that lazina, you minuna bi ayatina, fakul salamun alaikum. That when you meet those who believe in our signs, you say salam alaikum. You wish them salam alaikum. Islam pays stress on saying assalamu alaikum. It's the religion of peace. Now, minimum. In a day, every Muslim at least has to pray five times a day. Now, when he prays five times a day, even if he prays only the Fard Salah, the compulsory Salah, five times into two, when we end the Salah, we say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May peace and mercy and the blessings of Allah be on all the people on my right. May the peace and mercy and blessings of Almighty God be all the people on my left. Every Salah I say twice. I have to read minimum five salah. Minimum ten times I'm wishing salam to all the people on my right. The peace beyond people on the left. If I read the sunnah te moqada, that is another ten times. So minimum twenty times I wish salam to the people on my right and people on my left. If I read the normal sunnah, it may be more. Anytime I meet a Muslim, I have to wish him assalamu alaikum. May peace be on you. It's also mentioned in the Quran. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 86, it says, when anyone gives you a greeting, gives you a courteous greeting, wish back more courteously or at least the same. So anyone wishes me, assalamu alaikum, I have to say, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. If anyone says, peace be on you, I have to say, may peace and mercy be on you. If someone says, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, I have to say, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. I have to wish back better. If someone says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have to wish back at least the same. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If someone tells me assalamu alaikum, and if I say, wa alaikum assalam, words are the same, but it's coming from the bottom of the heart. Even that is better. So Allah says in the Quran, wish back more courteously. Now, when I'm traveling, and when I meet Muslims, how will I know that he's a Muslim? So, we have identity, beard. But today, in the media, if you are a beard, you are a terrorist. Yeah. Now, but uh, look brother, at this. Brother, let me complete the answer. You. Please let me complete the answer. If the Sikhs keep a beard and wear a turban, they are called as staunch followers. If Muslims keep a beard, they are called a terrorist. If the Christian nuns, they cover their head, they are called as religious. If Muslim women are covered, they're called as subjugated. 
मीडिया 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 सी दिस बियर्ड दिस बियर्ड कांट इवन हार्म अ फ्लाय एंड दिस कैप ऑफ माइंड इट कांट इवन हार्म अ फ्लाय इफ रीड द कुरान द कुरान डज नॉट से शुड कीप अ बियर्ड दर्ज ओनली वन वर्स इन द कुरान इन फोर तहा चैप्ट नंबर ट्वेंटी वर्स नंबर नाइनटी फोर वे मोज इज पीस बी अपॉन हिम ही कैच इज द बियर्ड ऑफ Harun alayhi salam are in peace be upon him and he says that o son of my mother why do you catch me by my beard that is the only place where the beard has come but our beloved prophet says in sahih bukhari volume number 7 hadith number 780 and 781 our beloved prophet said do the opposite of what the pagans do trim your mustache short and grow the beard now because it is a commandment of the prophet Allah says in the Quran, "Ati Allah wa Ati Rasul." Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. Our Prophet has commanded, and we obey. And it is a good way for me to identify. Many people, when I go to anywhere on the streets, I go to a foreign country. They see a cap and a beard. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. It's an informal introduction. I am spreading peace. So what we realize that it is an informal introduction. And like for example, if you go in a car. If you're the doctor, he puts a cross. Why? To identify that that car belongs to a doctor. If you have some emergency, you can stop the car, and you can ask for help. Now, when you see a person having a beard, as well as covering the head, you know he's a Muslim. I remember, and if you ask your grandparents, you ask your grandparents, 50 years back, 100 years back, they will tell you that the non-Muslims, when they wanted to hire a taxi, a cab, they looked for a driver. Who wore a cap and who had a beard? Muslim driver. He won't take me for a ride. When they wanted to buy from a grocery, they wanted to buy from a person whose owner had a beard. Muslim. He will not cheat. But today, if you wear a cap or a beard, it means you're a terrorist. So, if the name is maligned, we have to reinstate that glory to this beard. Fine. And it is only a label. It's a commandment of the Prophet. He said it. Therefore, we do it. It cannot even harm a fly, but it gives an informal introduction that we are Muslims. We can wish each other. And if you have any problem, if you require help, it's the duty of Muslims to help the neighbor. You stop a man with a beard and a cap. Inshallah, he'll help you. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Can we have the next question, sister? Salam alaikum, Dr. Nayak. My name is Monita. I'm a media professional. I wanted to know if accepting prasad is haram for a Muslim, and why? This is to ask the question that is accepting prasad for a Muslim haram or not? Prasad is the food that is given to God, to the idols that sit in Hinduism. Quran says in no less than four different places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number one seventy-three. In Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number three. In Surah An-Nam, chapter number six, verse number one hundred and forty-five, and Surah Nahl, chapter number sixteen, verse number one hundred and fifteen, it says that "Hurramat alaykum al-maytu to waddamu wa rahmul kinzil, wa ma ohilla bil gail labi." Forbidden for you for food are dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Almighty God's name is taken. So, any food on which any name besides Almighty God's name is taken, it is called as haram. That's the reason. To accept prasad and to eat prasad is prohibited in Islam. And even if you read the Vedas, even in the Vedas, since the Veda clearly mentions na tasse pratimasti of that God, there is no pratima, there is no image, there is no idol, there is no sculpture, there is no photograph, there is no painting. Even giving food to the idol is prohibited in the Veda. So that's the reason, because it's prohibited in the Veda, it is wrong to put food. On the idols. Similarly, because the Quran prohibits it for us Muslims to accept it or to eat it, is wrong, sister. Hope that answers the question. Uh, so one more thing, I am a Sindhi and I go to the Gurudwara. There is no idol at the Gurudwara. There is just a granth. We still have prasad in the Gurudwara. It's called Kana Prasad, but you still can't accept that. What is the reason for that? Sister, that's It's not accepted. Question. It's not offered to an idol. That's right, sister. I am a student of even the Guru Granth, and even according to the Sikh scriptures, the Adi Granth, Guru Granth, 
It speaks about oneness of God. And it says that Almighty God has got no idols, no images. There are various attributes given to Almighty God, Rahim, Kareem, Allah, various. Till here we are going together. But unfortunately, when you go to Gurudwara, though Sikhism does not believe in the concept of God in which there are images, but yet they worship the Granth as a Guru because the Gurus have gone. And on this, when they give the food, it's indirectly similar. Though according to the scriptures, idol worship is prohibited. So because of this indirect giving of the food, even according to the Guru Granth, Almighty God does not require to eat. So where's the question of you giving food to Almighty God? Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 14, Allah feedeth everyone, but does not require to be fed. So where's the question of you giving food to Almighty God? So sister, you are not following the Adi Granth. Now, because you're not following the Adi Granth, Almighty God does not require food. He can sustain without the food. He is the one who feeds everyone. Hope that answers the question. I would request the brothers to be seated for two minutes as we close. I would request our honored speakers who have come from USA, Canada to kindly come on stage. The brothers would like to have a glimpse and we have uh, this grand successful. We request brother Yasir Fazaga, Sheikh Jafar Idris, kindly come on stage with Dr. Zakir Naik. Let our audience have a view of our wonderful speakers who have come all the way, thousands of miles. They have come here to share their views. Many of our audience was not here on the other days. We'd like them to have an idea. We request the audience to kindly be seated for two minutes as we finish the closing ceremony. And I request Brother Dr. Bilal Phillips, Brother Yasir Fazaga, Dr. Jafar Idris from Sudan, Dr. Othman Siddiqui Arkari from Saudi Arabia, Kari Sherzad, and Dr. Mamdu Muhammad to kindly come on stage. Brothers and sisters, kindly give them a good farewell from Mumbai. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Takbir. <laughs> Jazakallah khair for being with us. Captain Asha Memory also from Saudi Arabia. They have been giving talks for all the last 10 days. We had six sessions every day. And uh, it was a wonderful time having them. We all have, the audience as well as the speakers have, I'm sure, appreciated, enjoyed the session. And on a whole, the conference focus of creating a better awareness and understanding of Islam and its message of peace and help remove misconceptions about Islam has been served. Mashallah. Love Akbar. I would request Dr. Zakir just thank them in a half a minute. On the microphone are wonderful speakers who have come all the way from USA, UK, and other countries. Some of our speakers, of course, have already left. Brother Anwar Ibrahim, uh, Abdul Rahim Green from UK, Salim Al Amri from UAE, Dr. Ahmad Saifuddin, and others. And of course, the former Imam of the Masjid Al Nabi in Medina and others have already left. Those who are here are present here. Dr. Zakir, to give his final words. Firstly, I'd like to thank Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala for making this 10 day. Islamic International Conference to be a grand success. And it's only because of Allah's help that this was possible. And secondly, I would like to thank our learned scholars and speakers. MashaAllah have come from different parts of the world, from different countries, from USA, from UK, from Saudi Arabia, from UAE, from Malaysia, and very different countries. Without them, this event would not have been possible. And though they're very busy, MashaAllah, most of them stayed for 10 days. And I thank them for their efforts. And inshallah, Allah will bless them, and inshallah, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them Jannah. And last but not the least, I would like to thank Yusuf all the audiences. That's Brother all Yusuf people, Estes, also from USA. From Texas. <laughs> from Texas, USA. We have other speakers, some in the TV studios. And I would like to thank the people of Bombay and the people of India who have come from different parts of Bombay to give us a patient hearing and to accept the message of peace. Thank you. Wakhar Dawan, Alhamdulillah, Bilal Yes, Brother Dr. Bilal Philip would like to have a word. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd just like to thank you all on behalf of all of the speakers who have come. Uh, we have been welcomed here in, in Bombay, in India. We've had a very good time here. And we thank you all for your uh, support and uh, benefits, your useful questions. 
and we ask Allah to bless you all and to guide those of you who haven't found their way to Islam as yet and we ask Allah to bring peace to this land and to the world through Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair brothers. We request our audience to kindly, as the speakers move down, give them a hearty with a takbir Allahu Akbar as they move into the pavilions. And may I, I would that is like Captain Al Shamimri, an ex pilot with the Air Force and also with the Saudi Arabian Airlines. Yes. I would like just to say one word to the brothers. May Allah reward them all. Beginning of Dr. Dakir Naik and the unknown soldiers, the people who are behind the screen who have done a lot of good effort and duties all these 10 days. May Allah reward you. If we don't know you, Allah knows you. Allah will reward you, inshallah ta'ala. We thank you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One word. Peace. Assalamu alaikum, y'all. Thank you, brothers. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making this program and possible. Lastly, and we request you. Lastly, I would like to personally thank that as many are aware that we have got more than 2,000 volunteers, 1,000 from Bombay, 1,000 from different cities of India, and they stayed here for about 12 to 15 days. That come a couple of days earlier. This event would not have been possible if it was not for the effort. So we thank them also. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them ajar, as well as all the other technical staff and the staff of the organization. Support. We thank you all, as well as the supporters. وآخر دعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين